The Simpsons Index, an online spreadsheet that is also a podcast. This is the podcast. Coming to you out of SideQuest Studios, this is The Simpsons Index, episode 167. Hello out there, I'm your host, Elliot J. O'Neill, and joining me in SideQuest Studios here as always, except when he's not BT Callaway. Oh, hi, hi. And joining us all the way from Washington State in the United States is Woody Siskowski. Yes, hello, I mistimed my substances. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve Guntley. Hello, hi, I forgot to come up with a clever line. Mm. <laughs> I don't even realize that's a bit we do. <laughs> it's probably not. I'm just, I yeah. use the same one every time. <laughs> hey, man, I needed something to keep me paying attention to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> not to editorialize too quickly, though. Oh, we'll edit. I mean, this uh, recording started a half an hour later than I was expecting it to, and I was not confident in my ability to make, keep things in my mind. <laughs> so that, that's what fair, I was most fair. worried about. I'm like, it's slowly leaking. I, I watched it twice today for that same reason, because I wasn't oh. completely certain I would remember it. But I actually don't hate this first episode. Oh, Steve. <laughs> still. Mm. <laughs> That's too, too many times still for this <laughs> one. <laughs> but yes, premise. This is The Simpsons Index. We watch and review three episodes of The Simpsons at a time, but each one comes from a different decade. And yeah, starting out today, we watched an episode from the HD era, a newer episode that is now 10 years old. It mm. was season 21, episode 22, Mo Letter Blues. First released in May of 2010, directed by Matthew Nastark, written by Stephanie Gillis. In this episode, Homer, Reverend Lovejoy and Apu take their kids to some island, leaving their wives uh, to enjoy Mother's Day on their own. We Weasel Island, beloved Simpsons location, Weasel Island. Yep. <laughs> the roundest <laughs> island in the world. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and Mo writes them a letter saying that he's leaving town with one of their wives. Hey, all, what'd you think? <laughs> Well, this episode seemed, as I was watching it, to kind of just be chaos. Like, mm -hmm. there was so much stuff going on at the same time, and it was all sort of moving from one thing so quickly to another. There was a scene later in the episode where Marge was like, Homer, I've forgiven you for what you did at the party. And I had forgotten what he had done yeah. at the party, which happened, like, six minutes before. There was just, like, so many plots. Mm. I watched this twice, and both times I glazed over what he did at the party. I, I looked away for a second, I looked back up, and she was chopping celery. Both times it I happened. I don't think he did anything. I think he said some mean things to Patty and Selma because they weren't happy with the pictures he was taking. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Patty and Selma being assholes, and he, he called them out on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the yeah. scope of Homer ruining parties, that's pretty low on yeah. the list. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's hardly lampshading on his head and, you know, staring at Maud's boobies, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I did, however, appreciate it more like at the end of the episode when things kind of came full circle. And I'm like, oh, OK, you know, despite all the chaos, that kind of fits together well enough. Mm. And then I learned again in, in my perusal of Wikipedia that this is based on a movie from 1949. Yeah. With the general same plot. And that made me appreciate it more. I was the same way because the first time I was watching, I'm just like, this is clearly one of those episodes that's making a reference to something. Uh, yeah. I don't know what they're referencing. And then I look it up. It's like, okay, a letter to three wives. Who the fuck has heard of this movie? <laughs> Why would you be making a Simpsons episode about it? But once I kind of got past that weirdness, I'm like, you know what? I appreciate that they have the plot from a movie to give them a little more focus. Mm -hmm. I felt like, yeah, for all the chaos and for all the multiple plots going on, it is actually still much more focused than most season 21 episodes. Like it's just got kind of one major plot that they stick with. And I can appreciate that at least. Well, it's a very fractured telling of that one major plot. Yeah. 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 It was odd. I just thought it was odd that they, like, went to this sort of amusement park cruise island. And so there were a bunch of scenes of, like, the kids going on unsafe rides in the background. Yeah. Well, like, the main action was going on in the front. And it really, I don't know, I guess when you do 20 seasons of a show, you sort of run out of ideas that have enough meat on them to be a full episode. So you're like, okay, we have this general premise of this letter, but how do we bulk it up? And they're like, oh, we'll make jokes about this weird carnival location they go to. But honestly, like, it felt like a well-developed enough premise that they could have just made that the focal point. I didn't really know why, like, they had to go to this weird other location. 
Yeah. Well, it's sort of a trend of the Simpsons HD era. You know, they take advantage of the wider screen, but they're only taking advantage of it to do these background jokes while plot and dialogue are happening in the forefront. And you sort of think, okay, does this only need to exist to keep me amused because the dialogue here is just so boring and, yeah, placeholdery? One of the jokes was like, uh, it is Marge like checked out like a Harry Potter book at a public library. I'm like, that was a first draft joke, right? Like, yeah. you didn't, you didn't, the, yeah, that was a placeholder until you were, uh, uh, you just kind of forgot to do a few more passes. <laughs> Cause that's like, oh, sure. oh you zing, you got him. <laughs> I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> Harry with that Potter joke. is popular. That's the very hot take. <laughs> Nailed no, it. that's a problem here. I think like the plot beats are pretty well thought out, but yeah, just the material around it and mm. you know the sinew and stuff. What what do you reckon, BT? Man, I got like one like red hot bullet. I'm gonna say for a little bit later, but ultimately this one, it's like you were saying. There's so many jokes in the background that. I really hated. Like, I genuinely yeah. thought it was stupid as hell. But they seem to be there, like you said, to punch up in case the audience gets bored. But the plot itself was actually decent. I actually had an okay time with this. I was immediately bored with the fact that, oh, could Marge be leaving Homer? Jeez, we've never <laughs> done this 17 times already. Right. I kind of wish Homer wasn't one of the ones in question. Maybe he was helping out the three husbands who were at risk. Yeah. But outside of that, I like the idea. But, um, yeah, there's so many of these background jokes are just mystifyingly stupid. Like, there's one where Lisa walks up and she's got, like, a carousel pony stuck around. And she's like, Dad, I might need some help with this. And then just leaves. Yeah. And you're like, okay, sure. <laughs> and then you've got this Carney who's just yeah. spouting random angry nonsense out of nowhere. <laughs> So, man, mixed feels on this one. I think that watching this on Disney Plus made it feel less disjointed because even though there were those commercial breaks, like they didn't sort of totally break up the pacing. Mm. And I think that generally (laughs) HD era Simpsons just tend to move so quickly and it's always so unclear how they get from one plot point to another that when you have those four commercial breaks you really lose the tread of an episode. So before, I, I haven't watched much Simpsons on Disney+, Plus, but I'm like, oh, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity to sort of go through a lot of these seasons that I've never watched, because like most people, I think yeah. I stopped watching consistently around season 13. Mm. And then after watching it, I still think that might be an okay idea. This episode didn't make me think that was a bad idea. Like, like I said, it kind of came together at the end. I really like Helen Lovejoy's gift to Timothy of the train trip. Yeah. That mm-hmm. that was very cute. I liked the bringing back of the trains as a hobby that he enjoys. Yeah. And, and, and the joke, it was interesting to see um, Apu and Manjula because I think they've just been totally excised from the show now. And it was a little grown worthy at the start when mm-hmm. he's playing the lullaby music that his mom sang to him. And it makes all of the octuplets cry. But I did get a chuckle out of the line Mahatma or Manatma. Mm. I don't know. The Apu stuff all fell very flat for me because they're still going to these same jokes. Like they know three things about Indian people. They have dots on their heads. They have several different gods. You know, it's like they keep going back. (laughs) And their music is annoying. Yeah. Yeah. They're going back to this well over and over and over with them. I did like, you know, the tense marriage felt real it felt like it was hitting pretty hard for a simpsons episode which uh yeah. I, I thought was kind of surprising though also the premise of i don't feel like mo is the character who's going to thoughtfully try and save the, that's, his yeah. friends marriages yeah. Yeah. That mo that's what totally, I yeah. as soon as he got into the opportunity run away with one of those wives like yeah. all right so like i was grateful at first that like this is not another Like, Mo in later seasons is kind of just used as a repository for suicide jokes or for being like a big old weirdo creeper. And he's neither of those in this. I thought this was going to be, I thought the plot with this episode based on the title was like, Mo gets a pen pal and learns to love again. (laughs) By the way, I have to call out this title. This is the third time they've gone to the Mo Better Blues well. Uh, yeah, what is Mo Better Blues? Well, I don't. Mo Better I mean, Blues. Exactly. It's a, it's Nobody a, knows. It's a Spike Lee movie from 1990 with Denzel Washington, where he plays like a jazz musician with anger issues, like a jazz musician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything that they're they're just kind of going to it. But in like the uh, Star Is Burns, his movie that he makes is called Mo Better Blues. They did another mm. episode called uh. Mo Baby Blues, where he bonds with mm-hmm. Maggie. I mean. They're going back to this well too many times. The well is dry. Yeah. It's dry. 
Still, they didn't hit on it as many times as they hit did the Mona Lisa pun and the break oh, my, my gosh. Uh, yeah. Take my, my wife, wife, please. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how bad Simpsons titles are, and it's almost to the point where you feel like they're doing it intentionally. Like who yeah. can come up with the most groany pun in the writer's room and then that person gets the gets the episode title. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's crazy. Like cause that's all they are now. They're just puns. Whereas, yeah, back in the day, like if there was a pun, great. But most of the time it was just telling you what's happening. Yeah, Lisa gets a pony. But yeah. the thing that's annoying is that the pun has nothing to do with, like, the content of the episode, because you're making For a sure. pun on Mo Better Blues, but the episode's not about blues at all. Yeah. yeah. Like, what was so the name of the movie? A Letter to Four Wives or something? Yeah. All right, sure. Why wasn't it just called A Letter to Three Husbands then? Yeah, there yeah. you are. <laughs> exactly. People still would not have known it was a movie reference. Mm. Yeah. Like, you would have no idea. So, Play Count, BT, have you seen this episode before? No. How about you, Woody? Nope. Steve? I must have because I did the whole Simpsons binge thing as well, but I think this is one of the ones that was kind of on in the background while I was working and I didn't pay super close attention to it. So uh, it, it <laughs> felt fairly fresh to me. We do have a number of episodes that we do put in the playlist of, you know, put this on when you're doing work and otherwise yeah. not really paying attention. Laundry playlist, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think this is an okay candidate for that because I still got the gist of it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And you still got your work done. And still got my work done. <laughs> <laughs> so was this a particularly wacky episode of The Simpsons? Again, it was all those background jokes that were wacky. Like there's a bit where the octuplets pin down Bart and one of them walks towards him with a rusty saw and you're like, mm. okay, what? They're, they're, well, they were going to amputate his leg. Yeah, I guess that's something kids do every now and then. Um, <laughs> sure. We got to brush up on your American Civil War history. Oh, yes. We, we do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. We train our children how to amputate limbs. It's uh, it's pretty basic. <laughs> I know the American healthcare system. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think this episode was particularly wacky. Like you said, I think the sort of wackiness came from that, oh, they're at a carnival and weird stuff is ha happening in the background. There was that weird carny that kept like mumbling to himself and like they yeah. would sort of zoom in on him and play this ominous music. And the joke is like, this guy's mentally unstable. And you're yeah. like, that's not really a joke, guys. That that doesn't play right. Yeah, I will say I'm a sucker for a decrepit theme park joke. So mm. these kind of landed for me a little bit. I'll be honest. I, I think it's just always funny when a theme park is just ludicrously unsafe. And yeah. uh, they sold that pretty well. I think they could have gone bigger and sillier in the background but i like the idea of it being a civil war prison with like <laughs> skeletons still out in the picnic grounds i don't know that was pretty funny yeah it, it was just odd that like that stuff was all there but like it wasn't explored very much because it was just kind of a setting for these flashbacks yeah and it's like if most of your episode is built on flashbacks why have this sort of detailed civil war setting well it's also sort of giving like an unnecessary extra setting as well because mm. like you have to get the husbands and kids on the cruise ship then you got to get them on to weasel and then back on the cruise ship and back like it would have just been tidier if they just went to a amusement park or just went on a cruise like yeah. i think doing both took up unnecessary time i don't know this way we got a dark dark weasel cave <laughs> yeah. i got a good laugh out of that i really oh, yeah, liked I never the visited ad. the weasel cave <laughs> yeah. and again like the whole thing with like the ship pulling in and just exploding like that's kind of wacky but like the joke was oh most of our cargo was explosives again that was like an underbaked joke yeah i mean every video game has those red barrels and they have to get around somehow by transport so. <laughs> those are the greatest places to converge if you're a bad guy it's just like you hang out around the explosive barrel it's like the water cooler whereas at work. some offices yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, everyone stands around the explosive barrel and chats about their day yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then doom guy comes in and shoots it um but i did want to mention uh in terms of wacky marge has a towel on and then puts a robe on over it who does that <laughs> yeah that's a weird move people who know that mo is omniscient mo is spying I guess, this, but... was this around the same time i don't know if this happened in australia or not but around this time uh maxim magazine put marge in as like a pinup like as a centerfold and they were making a big deal about that oh did maxim do it as well because i know it was in playboy and yeah oh yeah yeah my brother got me that for one christmas and yeah that was a family christmas as well mm. yeah yeah of course you know <laughs> hey merry christmas brother i got you this cartoon pornography <laughs> well, the thing is, of like, our folks. <laughs> i opened it right up expecting you know oh they're not going to show marge naked but nope there it is 
Wow. It, it's sort of weird because, like, it's normal cartoon Marge, but she's wearing, like, this sort of uh, see through. Uh, negligee. Negligee, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, your lingerie. Fuck uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, so through the negligee, you can see, like, human nipples. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> like, kind of a mustard yellow, though. Yeah, the kind of concept of, like, because the front cover is her on that iconic Playboy, like, seat, the rabbit seat, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. that makes sense. That's his iconic Playboy image. Here's Marge with it. That's kind of cool. Nipples is just, it's really weird. Mm. Either way, they were trying to like, I think around this time, they were kind of trying to pump up her like sex appeal angle for some reason. So like, I think they just wanted a moment to show a little skin on Marge, but they Mm. couldn't go full drop in the towel, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, made all the worse with Moe's creepy ogling of it. Mm. Yeah, that's the creepiest he gets in this episode, luckily. Yeah. So uh, it's not speci- uh, not really wacky, but I sort of question the decision to have like the narration of Mo set up at the start as you know the town's bartender. I hear all the stories, and it even to my point pans over to Wiggum and Sarah and the Van Houtens, mm. and then cuts completely to Reverend Lovejoy, someone who's never been in Mo's, never seen in Mo's. Yeah, yeah. No, I hate the line at the beginning with like ah, everyone comes to Mo's. Like no, they don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's been the point of several episodes. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, I can buy, you know, Apu's involvement because, yeah, Manjula coming to the pub and whatever, but, mm. yeah, Reverend Lovejoy to me was a bit of a stretch. Well, a weird aspect as well is that Mo is the narrator, but he's also the mystery. Yeah. Like, who's yeah. he taking with him? Well, he's narrating. He could just tell us. <laughs> I feel like this, on some ways, felt like those episodes that they do where they, like, take a s- tall tales or the Bible stories, and they mm. basically just plug Simpsons characters into there. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, like, who ends up doing what in that story is pretty arbitrary. And I, this kind of felt like that. Like, they took this old movie from 1949, and they're like, what if we just plug Simpsons characters in there, and it, like, their personalities don't really need to match. Well, I mean, it's an interesting dynamic, you know, Homer, Apu, and Lovejoy. It's not like, yeah, they've never done that trio before, and they can certainly bounce off each other. But, like, you're right there in the bar. You see Luann and Kirk. They'd be a fun, like, couple to put up on there. They're, like, getting back together after years of acrimonious divorce. You know, I think that's an interesting conflict point. Sarah mm. and Wiggum yeah. would have been an interesting conflict point. Sarah and you know. Wiggum I could have done. I think the joke with Kurt Luann is that uh, Luann is very not faithful to him anyway. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. Kirk and Luann, Kirk's too pathetic for you to care if Luann left and she's done it anyway. Mm. Whereas, yeah, I think replace Homer with Wiggum, have Homer there as like a support for them and be like, oh, let's try and figure out which one of your wives is going to leave you. But I just got so bored of this whole, oh, is Marge really going to leave Homer this time? Uh... But how about the heart of this episode? Did you guys feel the emotional core? Um, I feel like they were going for a more emotional core. I don't think it necessarily landed because, like you guys illustrated already, there was no tension here that any of their mm-hmm. wives were ever going to leave for Mo. There's no yeah. tension that any of them are ever going to leave, you know, mm-hmm. just because of the way sitcoms work. You know there's going to be kind of a pat resolution at the end. I don't know. I felt but... like Helen Lovejoy was enough of a minor character. Yeah, I was yeah. Laughing, Helen. <laughs> Helen, they treated very respectfully. Like, she's frustrated, but, like, she's not as naggy or as uh, pushy as she has been in other episodes. They kind of want us to sympathize with her a little bit. So they treat Helen nice and gently. I really don't like this interpretation of Manjula they've been doing ever since Apu yeah. cheated on her. She's a um, massive she, pain in this one. She's yeah. just, like, so naggy and cruel all the time, and it's just, I don't know, it's tedious. Yeah, none of the, none of the Apu stuff worked for me. Cause, yeah, because there was a bit at the end where, you know, Manjula's sitting with Mo and Apu comes home and she goes, oh, you know, this man has taught me that I shouldn't leave you, although, God, I can smell him and he's ugly as fuck and yeah. I hate him <laughs> so much. Oh, God, he's awful. But he's done a great thing for our family. He's like, what's wrong with you, Manjula? Why are you such a cunt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sucks because, yeah, all the Apu stuff feels really reductive as well. When, But also something that I don't like that this story keeps doing is like, oh, I was in the background of this scene and yeah. they do yeah. it for every fucking one of these. Like, <laughs> Yeah, man, I think my big hot take on this entire episode is going to be ultimately in the heart itself. Uh, there's a joke earlier on when Homer just goes, oh, n- nothing women never say matter. And then it's meant to be played off as, oh, isn't Homer being a dope? But that is the point of this episode. Mm. They get to the yeah. end of it and no, none of the three men have done anything. They've not changed anything. They've not done anything. They've been completely oblivious to this entire plot. They get home and everything's fine. And it's like, 
So what was the point? What was the thrust? Why were we doing any of this? Why did Mo have to sweep in? Why did the wives talking to Mo made them realize, oh yeah, he's not such a bad guy. We should stay married. Like <laughs> the only way that they were convinced that their husband was actually good was by being convinced by another man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just uh. Yeah, I think they just needed that come to Jesus moment where they're like scared and they have to reflect on the different ways that they might have been letting their wives down. Yeah. But again, that's a very un Mo like scheme. That is not a scheme that Mo would execute. He kind of casually tries to kidnap a child in this episode. Like, at the same time, we're supposed to believe he's like this magical matchmaker figure. I don't mm. know. I don't know who would have been better as the uh, facilitator in this situation, but I don't think it's Mo. Comic book guy. <laughs> Comic book guy. Yeah, Ralph Wiggum. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking, you know, CBG, you know, he knows story structure at least. Or at the yeah. very least, ha have Mo have a thing about, look, if you become a single parent, you won't have all the time to waste in my bar anymore, and I need those customers. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Could yeah, it have been him... Flanders? Yeah. Fl and then that yeah. role? Yeah, yeah why it ties not? Into yeah, into the whole not having Maud thing, and, you know, got to appreciate what yeah. you got all that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It would explain why he's, like, snooping on Reverend Lovejoy and Helen, you know? Like, it all makes sense. And then we don't need to bring that weird Parson character back. Oh, yes, the Parson. <laughs> yeah, based on, is that Spells of St. Mary, the Bing Crosby movie? Is that, yeah. Yeah, and they gave him a friend in this episode, a Louis Armstrong-like character. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That was that was a very strange use of our time. Because I, I saw him start talking and making some rhymes, and then he just continued mm -hmm. to talk. And then Louis Armstrong came in, and I just, yep. I felt very odd. It was very Family Guy feeling. Yeah, he came in in season 20. And if I recall, he was the one. He came in and told Lovejoy that his license had expired or something. So the last couple of marriage ceremonies he performed weren't real. So Marge yeah. and Homer get married again. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, we need that to happen again. <laughs> Uh, so it always speaks volumes of the heart of one episode where we start talking about other episodes. But mm -hmm. ultimately, did this feel like The Simpsons? Are these the characters we know and love? I mean, character-wise, for the most part, they are behaving like themselves, but joke-wise, and I guess structurally, kind of, mm. it's, it needs a few more passes, basically. It's still too rough and it's too all over the place, and the jokes aren't funny. Yeah. Homer's definitely on the jerk ass side in this episode. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've covered kind of a lot of it that like Mo wasn't really acting like himself and Manjula wasn't really act. Well, I guess that is kind of what she is like now. But I mean, for the most part, the, the characters behave like Simpsons characters. Um, but I agree. Yeah, just kind of lots of half-baked jokes. Like at one point they're playing uh, like a Dance Dance Revolution knockoff on their Nintendo Oh, Z yeah, that came out of nowhere. It was nowhere. like a Z, the Nintendo Z playing Dance yeah. Dance Evolution. It's kind of the same logic as like, Apple is now Mapple in the Springfield universe. It's like, I, at this point, I don't know if that's the joke. That it's like such mm -hmm. a lazy like knockoff of a real thing. But it, to me, it's just not very funny. I don't know. Yeah, uh, on this show, we call them parallel import jokes because you know, like bargain stores that will get like the knockoff brands instead of Coca Cola, it'll be uh, Kaka Kayla or <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I, hopefully, it's not KK Kayla. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you know the time. You get you go for a Pepsi and it's a Pop Zoo or something. And mm. yeah, <laughs> so yeah, Simpsons a do a, yeah. <laughs> so a Simpsons peppy. do a lot of these. Yeah, where it's uh, the Fun Tendo Z yep. or fucking Cosmic Wars instead of Star Wars with ju uh, Jim Jam Bonks. Yeah, yeah, they keep doing that. It's just like I get the joke. It's just it's not really that funny. I and mean, right now it feels like it's very lazy. I did like yeah. that this episode was clearly written by like a film nerd. Like, we forgot to mention the Itchy and Scratch. There's a pretty good uh, Man in the Moon, oh, yeah. Itchy yeah, and yeah. Scratchy bit that I liked. Although Itchy is a shit director. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's terrible. But I like the detail that they got on his costume. Like, he's got the yeah. jodhpurs and, like, the little mustache and the monocle. Like, I don't know. I liked that bit. Oh, it, it was, yeah, rare new Itchy and Scratchy that I quite enjoyed as mm. well. Because often the new ones are, like, fucking three-minute uh, movie parodies. But, yeah, this one was nice, neat, and... Yep. To the point. Yeah. But yes or no, would you watch this one again? Mm, laundry only, but even then, no. Yeah. <laughs> if I do commit to a sort of watch through of these later seasons, um, I would probably skip this one just because I feel like I got, I had a fine time watching it once, but now that I know the exciting twist at the end, <laughs> um, I probably don't have a big reason to go back. <laughs> I, I would watch it again. I mean, I think it's insubstantive, but it's not like offensive or terrible in any way. I think it's just kind of a, it's a minor effort, but it's not like a bottom of the barrel kind of effort. 
you know, those are the only ones I actively skip. That and like clip shows because who needs them? But uh, yeah, yeah, I would probably watch this one again if I did a, a rewatch. Yeah, I, mean, I, I probably won't seek it out or add it to a playlist or anything like that. But I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I would watch it again. No, I get the feeling that if we reviewed this earlier in our podcast run, I'd be a lot more mad at it. But I've seen a lot worse. We're dead it's... inside. <laughs> <laughs> We're very our calluses are hard from doing The Simpsons, and yeah, this is certainly one of their least offensive new efforts. But BT, how mm-hmm. would you improve this episode? What would you like to change? I mean, I've already talked about it. Replace Homer with Chief Wiggum. Homer can still be there, and you know what? Have one of the wives leave. Get to the end and have Mo. I'm all good with Helen Lovejoy because, quite frankly, Tim is a jerk. Like, there's a yeah. bit where they're talking and he just goes, oh, way to bitch up the conversation, Helen. Like, yeah. What, what wow. the fuck is wrong with you? Mm. So, you know, have her, Mo thinks they're leaving together, but she was just like, oh, no, I meant, could you give me a ride to the airport? You mm. know, something like that. And he gets it wrong. But, you know, to have a character leave, have something change, because why the fuck not? Mm. Um, yeah. And just more passes at the jokes. They're just so backgroundy and stuck on and terrible. Yeah, she decides to leave, but she's not going with Mo either. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. Uh, how about you, Steve? What would you like to change? Oh, yeah, I think I would agree. I think just another pass on these jokes, because I don't think there are very many jokes that are terrible, terrible, but they're all very clearly first drafts. And I think it just Mm -hmm. needs to be punched up a little bit. I think we just need a little bit more oomph and energy in this episode in general. For sure. Yeah, and I would actually, I would replace a poo. Uh, I would replace a poo and Manjula because they're leaning too heavily on the racial tropes. And I think Mm -hmm. if you just uh, give another character in there, you know, put a different, more interesting character, uh, you know, Chief Wiggum, Dr. Hibbert would be an interesting one to explore. Like, yeah, Yeah. I mean, there are ways you you can go. But yeah, the Apu stuff didn't work for me. How about you, Woody? Um, I would have liked to see more jokes about the location that they're in and sort of making that more of a major plot point. My favorite episodes of The Simpsons are usually like revolved around some weird location that they go to Mm -hmm. and sort of the weird attractions that are there and sort of the decrepit nature of it. And I just wanted to see that as more of a major point in this episode instead of like a little excuse to like show Lisa get a carousel stuck to her body. Yeah. 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 More of the dark, dark weasel cave. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. I want a whole episode in the Dark Weasel Cave. <laughs> Why start out the episode mentioning a Dark Weasel Cave if you are not going to go to yeah, the Weasel it's, Cave? Yeah, it's Chekhov's Weasel Cave. <laughs> if you, if you message, mention a Weasel Cave at the start of the episode, it has to. someone has to enter it by the end. Yeah. <laughs> I'm for that. And what I'd like to change, just what I was saying before, I think it's sort of the cruise ship and the amusement park are just unnecessary location changes. And even though the carnival were some of the better jokes in the episode, I thought, like, I still don't think it led to much material that I was really in love with besides, you know, the general decrepit setting. But so, yeah, I think keep it on the cruise ship as well because there's, I don't know, when you're out at sea, I think there's more of a sense that you can't do anything that's happening back on land. So I think that'd just drive the tension a bit more and... That's how they did it in the movie, uh, in uh, Letter to Three Wives. The whole movie is set on a cruise ship, and it's that kind of idea, like you said. Like, they're stuck, and there's that tension, and they know they have to come back at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like when you're really pulling for sort of settings and premises for your episode, just set the whole thing on the cruise ship, and then save your weird weasel island for another episode. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. And then get Weird Al Yankovic in to perform Weasel Stomping Day, because that's some <laughs> rules. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> All right, we are here. Woody, do you have any other notes about this episode before we rank this thing? It was weird. Timothy Lovejoy's daughter, is that Jessica? Yeah. Yeah. She was there at the end, just like totally randomly out of nowhere. Does she come back in like some later season that I just wasn't aware of? Yeah, I literally did the same thing when she walks off the bus. Like, what the fuck is she doing? They're like, oh, yeah, they went to a place for kids. Of course, his daughter has to be there. But she wasn't there to begin with. I don't think we ever saw her until. Well, and there's no interaction. I mean, I think she had a guest voice. I think the problem is she was voiced by a celebrity originally. And so it's just weird. It was Meryl Streep. Yeah, they didn't want to get Meryl Streep back for one line as a side character. And it was just weird that she was there and like her and Bart had no interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially because, yeah, the first time we see her is when they're coming back home. Yeah. And then Helen says, I've got two tickets to somewhere. And it's like, oh, do you guys even know that you've got a kid? Oh, okay, <laughs> no, whatever. No, never mind. She's gone again. But no, Jessica, much like Allison, who was played by Winona Ryder, they're put in the background and stuff, and I think just to fill out the numbers. And sometimes yeah. they're used in group scenes, but they never speak. Yeah. Mm. They're expensive voices. How about you, Steve? Any other notes? 
I have two little observations. First of all, uh, very rare appearance by Grandma Bouvier. Yeah. You almost never see her. And she even had a speaking line this time, which I thought was kind of a funny line, where she said, uh, I think those twins are evil. They started smoking when I was pregnant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind yeah. of a funny, weird line. Old, vaud- old vaudeville kind of style of line. The other thing I noted was that Mo said that Springfield's zip code spells out boobs. So I looked this up. There is no zip code in the U.S. It would be 80085. So there is no zip code like that. But if you're doing it the way you would in a calculator, you know, where you write it backwards and spell it out, 58008, that does exist. And that is the town of Barney, North Dakota. Oh, there you so, go. Well, there we if go. If anyone Confirmed. wants to know. Yeah, I'm moving to Barney because they've got the coolest zip code. <laughs> yeah. Moving to Barney for the boobs. How about you, BT? Any other notes? So I just really want to know if there's a strip club in Barney, North Dakota now. Just call <laughs> 80085. Yeah. I love you. You love me. <laughs> Hot. Yeah, just, okay, the whole, all the Indian jokes based around a poo. Most of them, I don't know if they're offensive, but they're just kind of lame. Although I did enjoy the radio station was called Sanskrit 98.3. Maybe I just like any kind of good radio gag. Mm, yeah. Uh, the kind of joke where Patty and Sam are like, ah, oh, you set off car alarms when you take a step. Homer's like, oh, I'm going to stomp now. I was like, for fuck's boo. sake. Yeah. Ah, that was so tedious. Absolute boo. Like, yeah. just the showiest, telliest. Oh. Despite the fact he shows up later in the episode, Ralph is dead. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he gets launched off by the ride, and yeah, that's that's it. It's over. Yeah. Best joke in the whole thing was uh, Mo has low blow boxing. Oh yeah. <laughs> where just, ah, my girl. Oh yeah. <laughs> my nards. My nards. My, nards. my nards. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. Yep. Add that into the list of In Simpsons video games that I'd love to see in real life. Oh, for <laughs> sure. And the last note I have is also the last, you know, note for this episode, which is Happy Mother's Day. We're pulling hard out oh. of fucking nowhere. Yeah, That's yeah. true. That was very shoehorned in there. Hey, remember this episode that has absolutely nothing to do with mothers? Happy Mother's Day. Yeah, well, yeah. I thought it came out of nowhere, but they did technically set it up at the start, but it's so like, oh, right, because that was the point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, coincidentally, I didn't plan for this. But yeah, next week is Australian Mother's Day. Is that the same for you guys? Or ours is May. Uh, it's in May. It's yeah, like the second or third Sunday of May. I forget yeah. exactly, but it's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. So Australia, Australian mothers have a different holiday. I guess that makes sense. It's not like it's not like Mother Nature's law of when Mother's <laughs> Day is. I guess no. it is a cultural thing. No, I think our Mother's Days are the same, but I think our Father's yeah, Days are different, are different because ours oh. is in September. Okay, yeah, ours okay. is on the 10th. May 10th is Mother's Day, just looking at my uh, calendar. And then our Father's Day is in June. A nice reminder for everybody out there. Yep. Yeah. By the time this episode comes out, you can panic buy a gift. Yeah, and take a note from this episode. Do absolutely nothing, and your bartender will take care of it for you. <laughs> yeah, just just forward your mother uh, an email with a link to this episode. Say yeah. happy Mother's Day. Or better yet, send <laughs> enjoy, her your enjoy own... Enjoy this C-grade send, Simpsons episode. <laughs> send her your own hastily thrown together montage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and time for my final notes. Now it's time, and now it's time for his final notes. Elliot's final <laughs> notes. <laughs> Don Pardo made a guest appearance in this episode. Who the fuck is that? Oh, yeah. I bet you guys be able to tell us. You, you're, we, we can. Who the fuck is Don Pardo? <laughs> oh, he was the voiceover performer for Saturday Night Live for 40 years. All Something right. like that. So, yeah, he's he's basically the voice of Saturday Night Live. If you ever heard somebody say, musical guest, that's Don Pardo. Yeah. <laughs> but not anymore, right? Because now he's dead. Now he's dead, yeah, so he doesn't do it as much. But, it's Daryl um, Hammond now, right? If he still was, yeah, now it's Daryl Hammond. Yeah. And he's also, uh, wasn't he originally in Jeopardy? Like, he was the yeah. uh, one of the announcers for Jeopardy? Original guy for Jeopardy. He did a lot of, like, movie trailers. I think he was on The Tonight Show for a long time. Nice. Yeah, he's, like, voiceover royalty. I only know this because, speaking of Weird Al, if you listen to the song I Lost on Jeopardy, he's also yeah. in that song announcing what <laughs> Al did not win. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh. Nice. Fucking Weird Al rules so goddamn much. Yep. Another bit of reducing Otto's character to just being a drug addict. And, mm-hmm. yeah, he has a hallucination ah, with the movie oh, Cars. Uh, I wanted more time with that because it's like by the time you realize they're doing a Cars parody, they're already attacking each other. Mm. I think you need to build it up. Show that, oh, look, these are the Cars characters. And now they turn feral. Yeah, that's right. 
have the trip go bad. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and it was dumb, but in most recounting of the events, I like him stopping off for corn, eating it raw, and then flossing <laughs> with the corn silk. I don't know. That just felt very, oh, man. very mo. There's nothing more satisfying in life than flossing out corn pieces. <laughs> it brings me so much joy. I will eat corn on the cob just to floss it out. I don't even yeah. want to digest it. I just like flossing stuff. Yeah, I've pitched the idea before that true happiness is simply rel- relief. So Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, no greater relief than getting a little bit that got stuck in there that you couldn't quite get with your finger or your tongue. I mean, have you ever like, had to like super had to pee and then you start peeing like, ah, oh, this is heaven. <laughs> that is true happiness. Oh yeah. It's time to rank this thing. On the Simpsons Index, we rank using our six point scale, which starts down the bottom at failure. Maybe if the episode was just meh, you give it participant, but for the positive rankings, you got okay bronze, good silver, excellent gold, but for the best, of the very best, the episodes which the Simpsons could not exist without, you give Cubic Zirconia. Now, I'm going to go first. Let me show you how it's done. Uh, look, I'm going to give it a participant. I felt like I should give it a bronze because it does go to a lot more effort than it's certainly a lot of HD era Simpsons go to. But yeah, some offensive jokes, some flat jokes, some just basically, I think, yeah, the word half-baked got thrown around and mm-hmm. I don't yeah. think it's one word. But anyway, I'm rambling, BT, your turn. Yeah, I'm going to go with participant as well. I did talk about before how the jokes were terrible. That's not quite right. The jokes are flat. And the trouble is it's flat after flat after flat, the compound interest of which is terrible. So it's I don't want to kick this in the pit of failure, but I think the only laugh out loud moment we got in the room was below the belt boxing. Yeah. And that was it. And, you know, the plot was okay. I could have enjoyed this if there was any sense of stake or weight to it at all. But it's just, there's nothing there. You know it's all going to be fine, and it's just bleh. What do you reckon, Steve? I'm going to go... With a very soft bronze, a very, very soft bronze. Very uh, pliable. But yeah, just, you know, feeling generous, and I liked the itchy and scratchy, and I liked all the deep film nerd cuts in there. Yeah, I agree with everything you guys are saying. Um, mm-hmm. But I think for this era of The Simpsons, this one's pretty watchable, um, and it's not, like, actively bad. Oh, fair enough. And uh, Woody, finish it off. All right. Yeah, I am also giving this one a bronze. It flew right by. I very quickly lost track sort of as I was watching it. But then at the whole, I was like, yeah, that was not unpleasant. And I like I like Timothy Lovejoy, even though he's totally a jerk. Mm -hmm. I find his affection for the model trains to be very cute. (laughs) Yeah. And so it was nice to see, to see those again. I did like his, today's the day I paint the mustaches on my train conductors. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was going to have such a good day. <laughs> All right, well, averaging out, that'll equal a dull bronze. It'll be the third episode from season 21 to be called a dull bronze. It'll be joining postcards from the wedge, which is like when uh, yeah. Bart tries to split up Homer and Marge and they find out the best thing for their relationship is ignoring Bart. And to surveil with love, which is a very weird and interesting episode mm. where Springfield install cameras everywhere, but then they discover that the Simpsons have a blind spot in their backyard. Mm. And so, yeah, everybody lets their freak flag fly in Simpsons' backyard. Yard. Especially Charlie's <laughs> yeah. playing with nunchucks in a dress. <laughs> yeah, this used to be a small part of me. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that line says it at time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that does it for the HD era episode. Now we're moving on to the teens era episode where we're going to review the great money caper. BT, do you know what this episode is? Uh, It's why they buy a bunch of capers and stockpile them until things (laughs) get desperate enough. They can sell them at an inflated price. (laughs) And they swim around in them Scrooge McDuck style. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Getting capers all over. It's very, very stinky. I can, like, hear that in in my ears right now. Like, I'm thinking about it so vivid I can hear the squishing. Oh, God, and I fucking hate capers. Oh, that, I'm <laughs> literally getting goosebumps right now. All right, we're going to go watch that. We'll be back. And we are back, and we just watched our Teens Era episode, and this was Season 12, Episode 7, The Great Money Caper. First released in December of Ought, it was directed by Michael Polcino, written by Carolyn Omini. In this episode, Homer and Bart get into becoming grifters until they become the grifted. Hey guys, what'd you think? <laughs> That's a sturgeon, not a caper. <laughs> the great money sturgeon would have been a very confusing name <laughs> already one of the more confusingly named episodes mm. being as there's already an episode with grifting in the title yeah yeah grift of the magi mm. magi i never remember yeah, which we, one it is i always get these mixed up they're one season apart and like they yeah. couldn't mm. be more different but like grift of the magi does not make sense as an episode name for the funzo episode but it would make more sense here I think the Great Money Caper was just the name they settled on because Grift of the Magi was taken already. Yeah. 
The Great Money Caper is a funny name, though. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Apparently, they're basing it on the Great Muppet Caper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. maybe. I just also think it's a funny name for a caper. It's mm. kind of like military plan, like Operation Bomb the Other Guys. It's just like, like a very <laughs> generic name. Let's all go head to the sex orgy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. I like the idea of calling crimes capers, though. Like, yeah. yeah. There's something very innocent about that. Jeez, officer, we're, we're not guilty here. We're just planning a little caper. Well, I feel like that the Simpsons in this episode lean into that aesthetic. Yeah. especially like with homer and bart and their like striped suits and fake mustaches and whatever mm. yeah bags with dollar signs on them <laughs> yeah no i i i love this episode i think this one's a really funny one because I, I love con man stuff i love anything with like mm -hmm. an elaborate ruse and none of these are terribly elaborate mm -hmm. and they're all kind of taken yeah. from other movies but this is put together in such a fun way and like they're so blatant about their grifting and they're so unapologetic about everything that it just makes it very funny to me hmm. i think the first half of this episode is fantastic it's really really funny and i feel like it's a good counterpoint to what we were just talking about in the episode we watched before of how fast everything sort of moves from one set piece to another mm. they never take the time to linger mm. and like the start of this episode they probably spend you know three four minutes at this magic show mm. and there's just a lot of funny jokes there i love the, the magician in the background spinning the tiger around <laughs> yeah the tiger's just a prop in his act I think that's very funny. It's also an amazing magic trick that he does, being as the chimps have Marge's dress on them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's just, there's really a lot of funny jokes. And I, like, I love Marge's very, very bland joke of large island iced tea. Sometimes <laughs> it's weird the lines that stick with you in things, even though they're not really funny. Yeah. It just like, that, that line has always stuck with me. I had a line in this episode that's always stuck with me too. And it's when uh, he serves the drink and she's like, I don't want to offend my mentalist. And then we cut to him and he's <laughs> no, like, yeah. if she doesn't like it, I'll just die. I used to think that line in my head whenever I would serve someone a drink at work or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that exact line would run in my head. I'm like, oh, I hope she likes it. Especially after making a Long Island iced tea. That is an <laughs> annoying drink to make. That's a heavy-duty drink. I also really love the line, it's always stuck with me, of, that's a party magic college. Yeah. <laughs> the magic uh -oh. College of Hyderabad is a party magic college. I love like, that. Like, it's just siblings being willing to argue about anything, <laughs> even though Lisa has no idea what she's talking about. Bart's just immediately going to argue. What I love about this opening segment is that, like, it's not the Simpsons' typical first act fuck you. A lot of about this section plays mm. into the rest of the episode. That that's plants true. the seed for Bart it's magic it plants the seed for yeah originally marge not getting a laugh but then when she gets drunk she's like a fucking stand-up yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I love drunk marge throughout this whole thing it's like, oh yeah drunk on, it's like, great is that a log island i see oh this i think it is <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah just playing into why she's uh, briefly stopped caring about what homer and bart are yeah <laughs> getting up to but yeah like a lot of this intro sequence played into the rest of the episode, and I loved it. like to visit that Long yeah. Island. If only it were real. <laughs> <laughs> Play Count, have you guys seen this one before today? Oh, yes. yes. Many, many times. Yeah, also many times. This is one of my favorite um, famous Elliot's VHS tape that he uh... made in the early 2000s <laughs> of... Uh, put this Simpsons playlist on when you're stoned thing, and it's like... <laughs> it was all these sort of weird, like, the wackier episodes from the teens era like this mm. and tomaco and oh, homer smoking pot and yeah speaking of which was this a particularly wacky episode of the simpsons yes pretty wacky like as wacky as they come i'd like to respond with russian profanities oh my god that's one of my favorite like non sequitur <laughs> jokes like yeah. so much later on they would have like one of these lazy little throwaway jokes and it just wouldn't have any context for the plot or anything it just seems like a half-baked mm. kind of family guy throwaway but here, yeah. the Sturgeon bit is really funny. They set it up properly. Like, this is mm. supposed to be this big shocking thing. And the reveal that they just left the door of the space station <laughs> open is so funny. And like, somehow first the Sturgeon of all, fell out. <laughs> yeah, the fact that they would have that fish in there, the fact that they would make it through the Earth's atmosphere to crash in their car, all funny. But the fact that they left the door hanging open like it's a fucking screen door on your back porch <laughs> is so funny to me. That's such a great bit. The mere equivalent of letting the dog out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when uh, Abe joins in on the grifting. Abe getting in on hijinks is a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, usually Abe is kind of just the butt of jokes, and it's really yeah. fun when he can kind of have energy on his own. And I love the animation on him when he's faking the heart attack. 
and he like yeah. does these little jazz hands after doing his dance about getting the strippiest wife. Also, <laughs> the craziest strippiest wife. Yeah. That's such a good adjective. Strippiest. <laughs> strippiest. What was his end game there? Because if that grift succeeds, he then gets up and be like, "Oh, I'm not dead," but. Then it's clear that he's grifted all of the people that he lives with. Like, I think oh, he's counting that. on them having like short term memories and just kind of <laughs> okay. forgetting that he was part of that. <laughs> Gonna live down here in the impulse zone. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, he is lying on the ground literally that whole time. No yeah. one's called an ambulance or yeah. anything. No, I, lo- I love everything on Grandpa on this entire thing, especially his explanation of why he's a grifter, because he had to do it in the back during the Depression. Or, or work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really just, good joke, too. His exit line of, just call me Mint Jelly, because I'm on the lamb. I well, love he, uh, <laughs> There's so much good ape dialogue, even just saying, I wrote the book on Flim Flammin, and ha ha, we horn swoggled you good. Like, <laughs> now you're on the trolley. Well, I like, yeah, they use, they use a book, and then he did actually write it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he did. <laughs> they used to call him Grifty McGrift. <laughs> I will say I think that the wackiness of this episode drags it down a little bit at the end. I don't Definitely. like the way that this episode ends. And generally this it's clear that they're doing like a parody of just like the plot in this episode is deliberately like sort of nonsensical and just goes to a lot of weird places. Mm. But I feel like once they start getting grifted and then Willie is thrown under the bus, there's yeah. just like that scene at the trial, you kind of lose track of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And again, I think that's a conscious choice of like we're doing a parody of these sort of intricate grifting double crossing oceans 11 type movies yeah but then at the end they're just like ah oh, we don't we don't care yeah like it's so open about like we worked ourselves into a corner so the joke is like mm. we're just forget it doesn't make any sense the surf's up ending yeah. and i don't know what the ending should have been like <laughs> i'm not paid to figure that out no. <laughs> but also it just doesn't feel very satisfying my somewhat hot take on that ending is that I love that ending. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like I, they do go to this well way too often of like the punch out ending, the uh, oh let's say mo ending. They go back to it way yeah. too many times. But this is one of the funnier times they've done it, and I think it's because the episode built up enough goodwill throughout, mm. and I think it's also calling attention to the fact that most of these grifter con man movies don't really end in a satisfying way or in a way that would like actually make sense or work. Like the resources needed to pull off a a scam the size of like oceans 11 would almost be as big as the take that they're getting at the end of the day right you know so it's it's a genre that's riddled with these inconsistencies and i think just leaning into it in the silliest most ridiculous possible way with them like surfing everybody's surfing (laughs) wearing their standard clothes and then the dead sturgeon jumps out and winks at you (laughs) i thought it was great it made me it makes me laugh every time yeah it's one of those endings you can only really use it once, and then after that it's going to get bullshit. But yeah. the one-time exit, I think you can get away with it. Well, the point about building up goodwill, I think, is, yeah, very good mm. point, because, like, that's what this episode does. I, it's doing a bunch of these, yeah, tiny little grifts that then amount into something bigger, especially, yeah. yeah, when they go for the big score, and then they do the big lie and everything, and, like, so it's built up in a satisfying way, but I agree, I'm not really a, a fan of most of the courtroom scene, and then... Like, to have it pulled the rug out from under you, like, I think it's very funny, but it's also been used as a point about a meta commentary of The Simpsons, yeah, how yeah, often yeah. they'll do this. But in this very particular case, I think yeah. it was done very well. Yeah, I mostly think it works. Unlike, I mean, I think the episode where they do the Lord of the Flies thing, they get rescued by, oh, let's say, Mo. That mm. works mostly because in order to have this plot, you need them on that island. And it's kind of like, look, we know the ending sucks, but do you want to have this fun adventure or not? You're like, yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. One, that one never bothered me because I yeah. feel like the focal point of that one is their time on the island. Where yeah, I feel yeah. like this one, the focal point is how are they going to get out of this wacky situation? Yeah, and the fact that it's the entire third act is painting yeah, is writing exactly. them into a corner. It would be like if the third act of the Lord of the Flies episode was them trying to escape and then it ended and they're like, oh, and then Mo rescued them. You'd be like, well, <laughs> wait a second. Yeah. It's it's sort of a side from the main point. Mm. No, it's solid. Po- and uh, for that reason where I don't know how I feel about the line when they're sort of explaining how the whole plan came together and it's like, uh, yeah, and we're all in on it. And Willie's like, Willie wasn't. <laughs> and <it's> like, <laughs> Yeah, Willie was very willing to shoot Skinner. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Itching to, quite frankly. I mean, so does technically, does he get charged for murder now? Because, I mean, he, did, he didn't he did know the gun was fake. He didn't know there were squibs under Skinner's vest, but he did 
take a policeman's gun and shoot him with it. Well, like, no, they, he just pulled the trigger. It was just it was full of blanks. Had well, no yeah, bullets. but I mean, the intent was there, that. right? Wouldn't you still yeah. serve some time for that? I don't know. That's like uh, attempted murder. What is that? Really? <laughs> <laughs> you get a Nobel Prize in attempted chemistry. No, I say, really? <laughs> no, it exceeded the statue of limitations after the beach day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> So a day about... at the beach wipes away all sins. <laughs> and so how about the heart of this episode? Did y'all feel the b- bumps? No. No, no. no. It, that's not the... I mean, if anything, it, like, the impetus for this episode stems from a very cruel act of child abuse. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> like, I don't think this is a particularly uh, cockles warming episode. The most heartwarming part of it is when the Michael Jackson impersonator and all his little marionettes <laughs> drops in the money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that as well, with hey, the two on either side sticky. just completely missing the hat, of course. It's yeah. very good. I've seen that, like, bit of the guy with the five, the Jackson 5, like, puppets. I've seen that in mm. cartoons and things before. I've never seen one of those in real life. It seems like it would actually be pretty awesome. Like, yeah. I would definitely give somebody some money if they were doing that on the waterfront. Oh, totally. Yeah, if you got that right, it would be good. I mean, maybe not the Jackson 5 is your choice, but, yeah. like, how well, about, like, not. make it simple. Be the Beastie Boys and get, like, two little Beastie Puppets next. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I'd love that. Beastie puppets. I seem to remember we had like a stupid variety show called yeah. Hey Hey at Saturday. And I know. I remember there was a reoccurring favorite contestant that did exactly that bit. Yeah, there's a weird thing where he did it back in the 80s and it was very popular then. And then they, when they reprised the show, he did it again in like the 2000s. And people were like, um, that's blackface. Oh, oh. That, that was a different one. That oh, was, was it? That How was, many of these do we have? That was, <laughs> that was actually, yeah, five people in blackface. Okay. And Harry Connick Jr. was on the guest judging panel for that and was just like, this is fucked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. When Harry Connick Jr. is your measure of morality. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I keep forgetting, yeah, the blatant act of child abuse. It's like, yeah, there are some horrible things in this episode. It's a moment, yeah, I only really thought about it this time on this watch. Yeah, that is pretty fucked, but it's also, it's just because it's so quick and funny, you kind of don't care. And, like, Bart blazes past it, too. Like, once he gets some money out of this deal, like, it's yeah. just all forgive and forget. He's perfectly willing to let, like, bygones be bygones, and Homer's in on his grift right away. Yeah, mm. he's just home eating a steak, and it's all good. Like, all of their subsequent grifts stem from this, like, cruel father. Mm. But it originally started just from his father being actually cruel to him. That's just a very dark kind of commentary yeah. on this joke. But again, I like how they keep it light with, you know, little jokes like Bart going, well, a good father would come to his son's Little League games. And I was like, I told you, I find them boring. <laughs> I showed up for all your interventions. <laughs> oh, again, that's so dark. Yeah. So many. Yeah, so many <laughs> good lines. just played right for around. so much laughs. It works. Yeah. But no, to me, the heart is Homer and Bart's little bond here. You know, they're, they're a fun duo doing illegal things, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, especially when they're covering for each other. It's like, how'd you do your act? You left the magic kit here. Or so it would seem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's Suckers. a great part. Yeah. I love his reading of what the hell are you talking about when they ask how the magic act was. <laughs> yeah. really, he really, he really drags that yeah. out, too. It's great. Like, it's, it's, it's in a yeah. way that you can't actually just nudge him and explain it away. <laughs> Yeah, but I do feel like the heart, I mean, I think that mostly when Simpsons episodes find heart, it's kind of right at the end of the episodes. Mm -hmm. And this episode clearly does not go that way. And since yeah. it doesn't come together with like, oh, Bart and Homer learned a good lesson at the end and are closer together. Like, since it just goes this sort of total non sequitur way, it loses potential to have heart. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately, did it feel like an episode of The Simpsons? Oh, completely. Yes. Yeah, this felt like Simpsons in its heyday. Yeah, this uh, even though it's season 12, which most people would be considered to be past like the peak of the show, this still has like lots of big like season 10, season 11 energy. You know, it's still they're still yeah. firing on all cylinders, I think. No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't really have a problem with any of the character integrity in this one. Like, you don't. They're very, they're very lacking in integrity. That's the whole <laughs> premise of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to the characters mm -hmm. pre-established integrity, yeah. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, and even though, like, yeah, it does do the wacky bailout ending. Yeah, I still think it felt very Simpsons the way it unfolded. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. And again, it's just details, like uh, when they're doing the whole, you know, blind kid dropping the cake bit. I love when Homer grabs and goes, that was for your deaf sister. Yeah. You'll work <laughs> this off in the acid mines. <laughs> the acid mines are great. He's laying it on so thick. And then eventually, yeah. like, they're becoming so nonchalant with their scams. Like, eventually the, yeah. the mechanic 
bumps into Bart, who's wearing yeah. a yarmulke now, and says, oil, never be a man. And then he just sticks his hand out, like, and the guy just, like, yeah, sighs a, and gives him money. It's like, that's oh, That's a yeah. weird joke, because the mechanic, like, clearly knows that they've been grifting. Oh, yeah. So it's just very, he's just like, okay, I, you got me. Yeah, yeah, yeah that good, seems, yeah. There's another good throwback when the guy who grifts them is, you know, okay, I'll let you guys turn yourselves in. It's like, really, you do that for us? Well, yeah, nobody's perfect. I knocked over someone's cake earlier today. <laughs> that <laughs> was Rolling so up, good. Yeah. I, I Props to Edward Norton, actually. I think he's really yeah. funny in this, and he's he's uh, he's doing voices. He's, he's really trying. Yeah. A lot of guest voices come on, and they're kind of just like doing their speaking voice because they don't know how to do like voice acting. But Edward Norton's yeah. going for it, and he's really fun. He does multiple voices in this one. Yeah. It's very yeah. good. I watched Death to Smoochie again the other day for yeah. some weird reason. What an old Eddie Norts. Yeah, he was good in that one too. What happened to his career? I'm confused. I think Edward Norton happened to his career. Oh, really? That's a shame. Mm. Yeah, he's famously kind of difficult to work with. He, he could have been making that Marvel money, but he had to be a big Edward Norton about it. Well, yeah, he wanted to change yeah. the script, and to be fair, that script sucks. Hey, he got yeah. he got to make that movie about the detective with Tourette's, which is, I'm sure, much more lucrative than any movie about Hulk. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, the choices we make. <laughs> <laughs> but yes or no, would you watch this one again? Sure. Sure. Definitely. Watched it many times. I'd watch it again. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. Loved it. Actually, before I ask the playlist question, I forgot a moment of integrity that I forgot. Yeah, Dr. Hibbert knows these people. I know. That is part <laughs> of the kind of... Again, yeah. I only really noticed it on the critical watch. Previous times, that just passed over me, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but episodes we'd like to watch again, we'd like to think about what Simpsons playlist would put them in. What episodes would pair well with this one? Adventures with Grandpa. So put this with yeah. that flying hellfish. <laughs> Mm. Oh, yeah, Flying Hellfish and the uh, Homer and Grandpa versus Sexual Inadequacy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, is this one of the only ones where we get all three generations involved? Quite possibly. I think it, watch yeah. We are the most learned Simpsons scholars we know, and if we can't think of another one, then... It's pronounced uh, yeah. learned. <laughs> yeah. Learn. No, they're, they're a good duo. They've got escalating levels of stupidity between the three generations of Simpsons <laughs> men, so it's really fun to see them, like, clash off each other. Definitely. Yeah. I really love the idea of putting the three of them together more often. Let's see that, goddammit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Drunk Marge, I feel like we've seen oh, yeah. that a couple of times. But That's yeah. always funny. Yeah. Especially like season one where she's like frolicking like in a Greek garden or something. Drink the drink that I have made. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, the squid port. A lot of this episode oh, yeah. is set on the Springfield squid port. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pair this with the Lisa babysitting one where Homer gets trapped in the fountain there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Homer holding various little flags with slogans on them. Yes. So in the courtroom, he's got one that says justice. I know he's got one that says mid-season. Yeah, yeah I love uh, the mid-season flag. That's, yeah, the, XFL. The French circus. Homer chloroforming, <laughs> like his love of chloroform. <laughs> that would be another thread. But I feel like all those episodes are sort of right around this little bunch. Yeah. yeah. But also, yeah, Simpsons shitting on Mountain Dew. Like, I feel like that's happened a bit. <laughs> Mountain yeah, Dew crab, crab juice. juice. <laughs> All right. Steve, what would you like to change about this episode? Oh, man. What would I change about this episode? Um, more Lisa. I always think more Lisa is uh, is a good way to go. And I think uh, Lisa really, really gets sidelined here, uh, which, like, I get this is more of a Bart Homer story, but, like, I would like to see her get a little more to do. Yeah, because it feels like that segment where they had Lisa going, I don't know, Mum, I'm a bit suspicious, is just so it could be there. Like, it actually didn't lead to Lisa doing any digging or anything, yeah. Yeah, but I think this one's, like, really solid right across the board. I, uh... I like that they have all these references to old grift movies and they go deep enough to like pull up the Sting 2. You know, that was a pretty <laughs> funny bit. Like no one no one's seen the Sting 2. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, not a lot I would change about this one. I really like it. I, I, I feel like I've liked it more watching it this time than I have in the past. Uh, I just think it's really solid. Awesome. How about you, Woody? What would you like to change? Uh, I'd like to change the ending. Again, mm -hmm. I don't know what it should be. I totally get that they write them. So, like, the more sort of complicated it gets, the harder it is to write yourself out of it. Mm. But I wish it wasn't such a blatant, like, screw you to the audience ending. I just, I'm fine with having the rug pulled out from under me, but I just wanted something that at least gives a modicum of answering the questions. Yeah. How about you, BT? Again, yeah, I kind of want to see if we went with a different third act, what could we get out of this? Because it's one of those things where, in retrospect, and this being such an old episode, that Surf's Up ending is iconic and really funny. But going through it on the critical watch on this one, it feels kind of cheap. So, and I mean, there's got to be something else, and I kind of really am curious what else we could get out of this episode. 
Yeah, I was thinking before about, you know, how all the griffs are so low stakes that it's almost a disservice that it goes this high stakes at the end. Like, I really, I think I'd be interested in exploring basically a more low key yeah, that's true. ending, you know? We go from Barton Homer grifting, what, maybe 50 bucks for a new cake every yeah. now and then to an entire courtroom of people putting Willie in prison for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Like, that's a jump and a half. Yeah, and uh, it almost doesn't warrant being that extreme at the end, but, yeah, the phrase getting written into a corner has gotten thrown around a lot, and I think that's, Mm. yeah, very apt. All right, we're here. Steve, do you have any other notes? I have no other notes. Uh, I just, I I hope we get to see more Drunk Marge in the future, because that's very funny. (laughs) (laughs) Me too, buddy, me too. How about you, Woody? Nope. Oh, BT. Yep, there's a good sign gag right at the beginning. The Great Linguini, five ninety nine. Mm. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> that is a good one. Oh, um, the check. If you, it's easier to see these things now. If you look at the check, the big check that mm. Homer and uh, Bart are giving to Grandpa, yeah. it's just gobbledygook writing. Like there's nothing written there, and it's just very obvious when you're watching it on HD TV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I-, I love seeing yeah all those uh, the magnifying glass being pulled up on all those little imperfections, and they're yeah, like. Yeah. Uh, people aren't going to pore over the minor details of this show in a few years. That'll never <laughs> happen. What? Uh, do like Barton Lace's back and forth of, wow, mom got a laugh. I wish she drank every day. <laughs> <laughs> that's no gentleman. That's my husband. Yeah. <laughs> Solid bit. I know. She's, she's, she's pretty good at this. Uh, they're like, she was made of chimps. And then they all attack her. It's like, folks, this is not part of the show. Please help her. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently that was a late addition because the scene used to just cut without that. Uh, okay. And, oh, way better to have it for sure. And that was just Mike Scully. Like, cause yeah, they couldn't get in any of the voice actors to quickly turn that around. So yeah, Mike Scully in a weird, rare vocal appearance in The Simpsons. Mike Scully. Oh, no, I see. Uh, I do really like Homer being led on the stand, where it's like, "I told you, my memory is fuzzy, fuzzy like Willie's beard." <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's hazy, hazy like the moors of Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and my final note, and this could potentially be uh, what would you change, is let's just see the Albany ham scam played out in its entirety. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting. <Yep. laughs> it's such it's a good flow of words. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> All right, time for my final notes. Apparent Robbie Krieger of the Doors had recorded a part for this episode that ended up getting cut. Really? And it's weird because was he the sturgeon? No. <laughs> That's how you know it's a Mike Scully episode. If yeah. there's ever like a classic rock musician who tries to give a part in it, it means it's a Mike Scully episode. <laughs> that makes sense because apparently he negotiated letting them use The Doors the End in the uh, oh, Hello yeah. Mother, Hello Father mm-hmm. episode. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, on the proviso that he could get a guest spot. And then they cut his guest spot, and he has not been in The Simpsons since. So, Ooh. yeah, who knows? But So yeah, they slammed so. that door, you could say. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> very good mm. i love how marge calls out um the magician on the fucking boring patter <laughs> <laughs> i enjoy watching magicians and magic but yeah the fucking stories like, man. well the king of siam needs more scarf uh, yeah. scarf silk silk scarves i can't talk africa <laughs> blabber is right yep. <laughs> um <laughs> you don't smoke a pipe that's, that's right, right. <laughs> Wigan puts them in the Rick James suite, which is super freaky. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Oh, okay. So here's something I didn't know before today. And being a future armor fan, I should have looked this up earlier. We don't have Manwich in this country. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Can you please. Uh, do we have Manwich in this country? We do. Can you please it's, explain it's, for uh, our Australian okay. listeners what the fuck Manwich is? It's a sloppy Joe. It's a loose beef sandwich. It's like very. It's got this kind of like sweet. Which is ground, ground beef and barbecue sauce, right? Basically, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, the point is that it's just a big old mess and it's just kind of difficult to eat. It's pretty. I haven't eaten one since like elementary school cafeteria days. Like it's not something you see on menus anymore, but. Mm. Uh, yeah, if you went to public schools in America, you've probably eaten a sloppy joe or two. Yeah. Right. I see. Yeah, Manwich. Because I, I looked it up as well, and I saw there is like a branded version that comes in a can. Like... Yeah. I was under the impression that it was just like, you know, there's grinders and hoagies and footlongs and subs. And I thought just Manwich was a part of that family of sandwiches with multiple names. Sandwich yeah, family. It's, it's, it's like a sub, but like more simple and not fun to eat if you're an adult. <laughs> <laughs> also it's weird that patty and selma decided to just put a wig on maggie yeah uh, witness, witness protection, protection. Dude. but how did that conversation go hi i'm putting a con on homer who's conning people can you look after maggie and put her in witness protection <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't need to but here's a wig yeah. <laughs> all right it's time to rank this thing and woody you can go first 
All right. Um, I'm going to give this a B, which maybe is a little low, because I agree that it has a lot of really funny jokes in the beginning. The first A, a B is a in B. a bronze? A B is in a bronze. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nailed it. That's the system, right? Yeah. An A for a gold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's like the elemental symbol of mm-hmm. gold. Oh, no, an A for an argon. There you go. Is, yeah, it's a lot of funny jokes at the beginning, um, but I'm always left a little cold at the end. And it's just a, sort of a matter of like the potential is there so high and there's so many funny parts that I wish it sort of ended on a more satisfying note. Mm. But it's still it's still a great episode. How about you, Woody? Oh, uh, Steve. Steve. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, oh, Fuck. no, all good. That's okay. I know we, we sound exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, solid gold, baby. I, I like this one. I think this is a gold episode. I think this is one that's going to be in more rotation when I'm watching The Simpsons now. I think this is a, a very, very solid, funny episode that I really enjoyed. Yeah, I'm going uh, silver. I think, yeah, this is a solid, silly episode. And mm. for those ones, yeah, I tend to go with silver. So I'm just, yeah, keeping the trend here. I enjoy oh, this I'm one. Oh, I'm sorry. Of- I, meant, I meant to give this a silver. Oh, that's, okay. that's what I meant by B. Mm. <laughs> oh, Your in... rating system blew my mind. The B was for blowing my mind with this confusing rating system. <laughs> Not to be confused with an A, which is amazingly bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we got to get a new system. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So silver, gold, silver, BT. I am a little split on this one. I feel like the first half is a silver and the second half is a bronze. However, I'm going to split kindly and I'm going to say a silver. Mostly because I think about, I think Simple Simpson is my um, standard for what a silver needs to be, mm. uh, which is, you know, the Pie Man episode. Uh, and I think this is, you know, equally good, if not better than that episode. So I would say a silver. Well, averaging out, this will be a shiny silver, and I really like that for this episode. It'll be the third episode from season 12 to be given a shiny silver. It'll be joining Pokemon with Michael Keaton is a prisoner artist. Oh, and- uh, yeah. Yeah. Marge's... Great episode, terrible title. Yeah. 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 Worst yeah. fucking title. And also Children of a Lesser Clod. That's when mm-hmm. Homer injures his uh, ACL and um, oh, yeah. mm. opens a daycare center in his yeah. house. But interestingly enough, also shiny silvers from season 11, Missionary Impossible, which we reviewed with uh, you, Woody, and Steve. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that one. And also Grift of the Magi. God Ooh. damn. <laughs> That's just going to make it even more confusing now. Isn't that, you know, that shiny silver episode, the Griff one. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) All right, guys. Well, look, that does it for the Teens Era episode. Now, we are getting into the classic era. And holy fuck, what a classic we got lined up. We've got Marge Be Not Proud Beach. Which episode is this? Uh, This is the one where Marge is a bee that should not be proud. So she's a silver? I mean, not proud, but she's a bee. <laughs> she's, a, she's silver. a silver. <laughs> a silver bee. That doesn't make sense. Bees aren't silver. Learn the nature, Elliot. <laughs> All right, guys. We're going to watch that, and we'll be back. All right. And we are back, and we just watched our classic and final episode for today. This was Season 7, Episode 11, Marge Be Not Proud. First released in December of 1995, it was directed by Stephen Dean Moore, written by Mike Scully. In this episode, this is a fucking Bone Storm episode, and oh my god, <laughs> the emotions. What did you guys think? Buy me Bone Storm or go to hell. <laughs> yes, oh my god. Classic, classic, classic episode. This one is special, I think. This one is kind of unlike oh. any other episode they've ever done. This may be my favorite episode of The Simpsons. It's definitely the episode that I have the most emotional attachment to. Mm. It's the one that gives me the most feels. Mm. It's not very subversive. It doesn't really do anything unpredictable or weird with the formula, but it just really resonates with me. I... Every year I watch this and the Mr. Bean Christmas special. That's uh, nice. Yeah. Excellent pairing. This one resonates. This one really felt yeah. like it understood what it felt like to be like this age at this time. Like I, I would have been probably like 11 or 12 when this episode came out. So I was right around Bart's age. And it was just mm-hmm. like, it, it was like seeing yourself in cartoon form. Like so many things. Like, you know, the thing where he waits outside the video game cabinet looking sad, hoping someone will look at it. 100% a thing I used to do. Yeah. <laughs> Accidental Bart grifting playlist. Oh, wait, you used to do that? Did it actually work? No, of course. Of course not. It would never work. I mean, have you ever seen a sad kid in a grocery store and offered to buy him something? You'd get arrested. <laughs> yeah, with Gavin. And Gavin, shut up, Mom. Buy two. I'm not sharing with Caitlin. And Bart's response of that must be the happiest kid in the world. Kind of yeah. when I first saw this episode, that was kind of my response, too. 
I was like, man, I wish my mom just bought me whatever I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And we actually reviewed the other episode that contains Gavin and um, she doesn't actually have a name, but she's just referred to as Range Rover Mom. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. That was the mid-90s. That was a pre-soccer mom, I guess, thing. Yeah. Well, it's like I hadn't really taken off yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, I totally know what you mean about, like, this captures what it was like to be a kid in mm. this time, especially with the relationship with video games. And yeah, I too was, I think, around 10 when this episode came out. So yeah, and this is right around the time where I was shifting from Genesis to uh, Nintendo. So yeah, I was all about all these characters that made a cameo and it's like holy fuck <laughs> it oh, took yeah. me so long to realize that that character who yells at bart to just take it take it take it take it take it take it <laughs> is supposed to be sonic the hedgehog because oh, it yeah. really mm. does not look like him and the voice also i don't know what i thought he would sound like but it was not that he sounds like urkel yeah yeah, yeah. i actually liked the sort of simpson sized design and you know, this design came about because the fans had a really bad reaction to the Simpsons' first design of Sonic, so they <laughs> went back and Petitioned. redrew him. Yeah, we yeah. respect that. So the only person in this little fantasy that he has that doesn't appear in Smash Brothers is Lee Carvalho. So I think uh, the gauntlet, <laughs> has, gauntlet has been thrown, Nintendo. Yeah. No, I Get love him in that there. Carvello is there as like the sensible side of don't do it, son. This yeah. is not gonna help your putting. Well he's so, he's he's only implying he shouldn't steal that game because it won't help his yeah. putting. But he should he should <laughs> steal Lee Carvello's putting challenge. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think this is one of the earliest cases I could remember of seeing video games in a piece yes. of pop culture. And this mm. blew yes. my mind. I was like, what? Adults know what Mario is too? That's insane. And they nailed it too. They got the yeah, vibe right. Like they it's clear that whoever wrote this episode likes video games. They get that. And Mortal the more the Mortal Kombat, Kombat, just right. Kombat reference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Or even yeah. just the ad where the kids are playing a video game where they're beating up a tank and like boring. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like this ad as well was really making a reference to all those, you know, Sega does what Nintendo don't sort of nineties extreme ads. Oh yeah. 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 And especially like the Bone Storm, like the gameplay that they show is basically, yeah, two Goros beating up on each other <laughs> while random body parts are falling through the screen. I it's love great. that. It's just like falling like a waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> and then on top of everything else, with everything else this episode does right, you also have the single weirdest and most brilliant piece of guest casting they've ever done. And that's mm. Lawrence Tierney as Don Brodka. Like... What kind of deranged mind thought to put that man in this cartoon? I, it's beyond me, but it works perfectly. Oh yeah, I have he's so never, scary. I have never yeah. been more intimidated by a cartoon ever. Like he is genuinely <laughs> intimidating. I, I'm sitting here like you see Bart like twitching in his seat. I'm like, I I feel this yeah. like this long silent stare that he gives him. Like oh my god, he is so intense. It's crazy. Nancy Cartwright is so good in this episode. Mm, like her voice really performance good. as Bart because like he. Don Brocka makes that weird joke about smoke being blown up his ass, and it's, like, very inappropriate <laughs> for a kid, but Bart just is not clear what any of it means, so he's yeah. just kind of sitting there, like, awkward, like, ha, 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 ha. He just yeah, has so how... many awkward parts. Yeah, and he just kind of rambles on, especially the phone call to his parents, where he's like, your son Bart has been caught shoplifting. Uh-huh, that's yeah. right. Well, try and have a good Christmas. Well, they weren't home. Uh huh. There were That's so right. many. There's so many Don Brock. Like I really resonated with so many parts of this episode as a kid. But there were so mm. many Don Brodka jokes I just never got, and I still yeah. a lot of them I don't really get. Like he's a he's a very memorable character and he's very well performed. But like so many of the lines are just very weird. Like when he says. Your son broke the eleventh commandment: "Thou shalt not yeah. steal." And like yeah. that's technically the seventh commandment, and that's <laughs> yeah. just and not ten. that funny of a joke that he sort of got them mixed up. But it makes me think that there's supposed to be something else there. Like, is the joke that there's really only ten, or I don't well, know, it, or the, like when the, he says "catfish" later, like because Bart <laughs> doesn't know what "capiche" means, so he says oh, "catfish." I love, I love that line. My, well. so good. My possibly over-explaining of the uh, the 11th commandment thing. When I was growing up, my parents would joke about the 11th commandment, which was, thou shalt not get caught. Uh, so <laughs> I'm wondering I'm wondering if that's kind of a play on that. Like, I think that's kind of like a boomer thing I've that my parents had. I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I don't think that's in common use anymore. But I think when my parents were coming up, that's what the 11th commandment was, is thou shalt not get caught. Okay. Well, 
apparently and unsurprisingly for anyone who's aware of Lawrence Tierney is that he was difficult to work with on this show. Oh my god. And apparently would like refuse to deliver lines of jokes that he didn't get. He also wanted to do this character as like a deep southern accent at one point. But you know, they eventually got the takes that they got and yeah. Didn't get stabbed. Didn't get stabbed. <laughs> I did not realize how much of like a train wreck Lawrence Tierney was. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I just kind of read through his like biography and everything. And I mean, this guy mm. has been arrested dozens of times for drunk and disorderly and for assault and for all these things. He was in the 50s. He was put in a mental institution because he broke into a church while he was wasted and like passed out in the pews. Like on Reservoir Dogs, like Quentin Tarantino brought him back from obscurity, gave him this big role in this big movie, and they got in a fist fight on the set because he was refusing <laughs> to do anything anyone said. Even the cast of Seinfeld said they wanted to have him back yeah, as yeah. Elaine's dad and that they, they didn't invite him back because he scared everybody too much. Like he was a real deal guy. <laughs> Yeah, the story I know from Seinfeld is that like he pocketed one of the knives from a butcher's block that was on the Seinfeld kitchen set, and everyone in the crew was like uh, whispering amongst us. He just took that. Did he just? He just took that knife. What should we do? What should we do? And Jerry Seinfeld, in all bravado, just walks up to him and go, "What you got there, Lawrence?" And then apparently Lawrence pretended to do the psycho bit and was going like, "Re, re, re," threatening oh, wow. Jerry with the knife, and everyone was just like, "Yeah, butts clenched." <laughs> yeah, I want to see the fist fight between him and Quentin Tarantino. I feel like that's very one-sided. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on, Quentin Tarantino. I could take Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Even as like he was like a sixty-something-year-old man at the time of the filming of that yeah. movie, but he's just like built like a fucking shed. Like he's this huge, yeah. muscular they, guy. They say it in the movies, like the thing. Motherfucker looks exactly like the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. But man, and mm. to to think that this guy lived to be eighty-two years old, and he he uh, spent the last of his days in a nursing home. That does not seem like the oh. way that this guy with this life would have gone out. But yeah. uh, I imagine the last 15 years of his life was like death would show up and be like, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, as difficult Not as yet. he was, like he got one of the most singular Simpsons guest performances ever. Oh, like you can't imitate this. You can't even try. Uh, it's just such a weird thing. And I'm not sure how much of that was coming through just because he was refusing to read jokes or just because mm. he was just so good. But uh, man, crazy performance. Yeah, oh, it's, it's one of these things where, yeah, all the pieces sort of come together, and especially, yeah, with these deep character actors, you know, like, oh, incredible oh, performance. So, and I think this is a great episode example in terms of structure for setup, reminder, and payoff, because we mm. get that with Lee Carvello's putting challenge, and we get that with things like tuck-in time and showing that change that's going to happen. They're like, the heart in this one is amazing, along with all the yeah. jokes. Yeah. All right, let's get into a questionnaire. Play count. Have you ever seen this episode before this viewing? <laughs> No, what I is The Simpsons? <laughs> yeah, what, what is this podcast about? The Simps, <laughs> The Simpsons? <laughs> oh, well, you've seen it written down. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I've probably seen this episode more than any other episode because it's the one that I make everyone watch at Christmas and yeah. I show new people who are involved in my life. It's either yeah. this or Cape Fear, I guess. But Ah, uh, man, it's a good one. Also a great Christmas yeah. episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. But no, that's the strange thing with this one. And it's like a Simpsons fact that like was a weird realization that, yeah, this is only their second Christmas episode. Mm. Yeah, that yeah. is crazy. And I sort of was reading, yeah, they were saying that like, with the pilot episode being so important, they didn't really want to overshadow it or try and do something again too quickly. And also, you know, doing a Christmas plot is kind of a easy trope to fall mm. back on. Which would be demonstrated with The Simpsons basically doing a Christmas episode every second year now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I will say the thing about this episode is it's not very subversive, like, as a Christmas episode. Like, mm. the Grift of the Magi episode with Funzo is sort of a lot more, I don't know, wacky, like, Simpsons-style yeah, sure. sort of poking fun at pop culture. And this sort of harkens, I don't know, this is really clear, like, they're going for an emotional through line that I think a lesser show would, I don't know, would sort of fail to stick the landing here. And I think mm. it's a testament that there are definitely some, like, pretty obvious musical stings here that they're like, oh, they're really reaching oh, for, for sure. the heartstrings here. But they, mm. always, they always land. Yeah, That's the thing, it works. Like, you don't have to do the subversive plot if what you've got works. And it yeah. does, absolutely. And, yeah, this one sort of proves that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with sort of taking a sort of a cliched format. Mm. But, like, I don't think I lean into the Christmas aesthetic that heavily anyway. It no. feels very much just part of the overall story that they're building rather than the focus. Yeah. yeah. 
But was this a wacky episode of The Simpsons? Obviously. Uh, pretty grounded. Pretty grounded, mostly. I mean, we have some flights of fancy with the talking car seat and the, mm. you know, the fantasy about all the different characters. But uh, for the most part, it's grounded in a pretty realistic situation, I think. Uh, the fantasy about Juvenile Hall as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the sort of flashbacks and cuts to other things like the Troy McClure video that's in here is one of the weaker Troy McClure videos, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, it doesn't quite go anywhere to be funny um yeah. and the yeah, same of the ki- short <laughs> yeah the kids at juvenile hall that none of those jokes really land for me except when bart is i like come on new bike yeah <laughs> <laughs> based on what the other kids in front of him have been getting i don't know i really dig the um affection that nelson has towards his book of carpet samples yeah, that's, that's hey, good it's more than he had before Homer's got a bit of dumb wacky in this, so there's that great where they're going across the family photos and Bart's holding up the ice <laughs> yeah, stink. Yeah, ice stink. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember saying I that. I also really, really love Homer's monologue about stealing and why do you think you go to church? <laughs> what, Captain What's-His-Name. I love the way he refers to Reverend Lovejoy. Captain What's-His-Name, which is how I refer to authority figures all the time. Yeah. Why oh, do you yeah. think I took you to all those police academy movies? For yeah. fun? Well, I didn't hear anyone laughing. That's a very it's a very good jab at the police academy movies. I love the way Homer's simultaneously able to jab at how shitty those movies are, yet still enjoy them for the wacky sound effects. Oh, police academy shitting on playlist as well, because yeah. he's thought it'd be fun and exciting, like that movie Spaceballs. Oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. Like he gets so distracted, like from his tirade, mm. like thinking about the police academy <laughs> sound effects, he completely forgets what he's yelling at Bart for. Oh, <laughs> Stay yeah. out of my booth. And his and his love of nog, I have often thought about the line mm. where he says, no eggnog. In fact, no nog, period. <laughs> and it just always makes me wonder what other kinds of... Isn't there another episode where they have corn nog? Yeah. Wait, is that the Hurricane uh, Hurricane yeah, Nettie so. where they're trying to find food on the oh, shelf? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yep, and what is beef. Yeah, and, and I, are there any other kinds of nog? <laughs> I, I haven't had... I actually only had my first good eggnog last year. A good eggnog <laughs> is good. It's, it's I've, good eggnog eggnog is good. good. I've never yeah. liked eggnog. I can't... I can't. It's too you thick. Have to it's too gross. You have to just be yeah. in such... You have to be in, like, a very precise mood. It is very odd because sometimes you'll mm. drink some and you're like, this is like drinking snot. Yeah. yeah. Other times you'll drink it and you're like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever and then the next day you'll drink it and it won't taste right at all so it's just it's it's a mental state yeah no because i've like i've ordered eggnog out like just wanting to know what it was like and never liked it but yeah my sister-in-law has got like yeah the old family recipe and it's like it was more of a custody drink whereas Mm. yeah um snot that was a very um (laughs) gotta get that uh, fresh nutmeg on there Mm. oh yeah Uh, and homer's other bit of wacky which i like which is that's odd we didn't have a message when we left the house (laughs) yeah i was thinking about that that's not how the answering machine should work though right like when Bart replaces the tape, yeah. it shouldn't show that there's a message there. It's worth it for the joke. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I, very unnecessary burn on Alan Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> he, he doesn't deserve that. Come on. He's, he's oh. right in the tape rack next to the Doodle Town Pipers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where no one will listen to it again oh yeah. so good <laughs> i was thinking about another distracted homer before oh yeah when he's in bed trying to devise a punishment and then he ends up drawing oh, yeah. a robot that's i love the way that he writes the word <laughs> robot on it so that homer actually is a surprisingly good cartoonist like i yeah. don't think i could draw that cartoon and it's, it's creative i like the way the robot is roasting a hot dog yeah <laughs> <laughs> in a bin oh wonderful Mm -hmm. the other bit of wacky of course is bone storm and what it'll do to you if you put it into your games console as well yeah like apparently it's like overworks the fan in your console and just (laughs) like because yeah the extremeness just blows your hair back millhouse is so windswept in that moment you think you mean thrill ho thrill ho of course it's based on uh, the Maxwell like yeah. VHS tape or like the oh, certain kind oh. of player tape. You see, you've seen that picture of the yeah. guy in his chair sort of being blown back by the force of his TV or stereo system. Yeah, um, I, I think that's pretty clearly what that Millhouse drawing is based on. But mm. man, just think oh. of how many like completely iconic Simpsons moments you get back to back to back in this. I mean, you get Thrill Ho, you get Bloodstorm, yeah. you get this is the time of year when all religions come together to worship Jesus Christ. You get four finger <laughs> discount, you get length of yeah. rubber hose, like over and over and over again. It, it's just like an endless meme generation factory, this episode. Yeah. Oh, and I really I love the cup and ball thing. And I'm surprised yeah. that hasn't come up. as like another big thing is really into this cup and ball now. I love this as well because 
like the episode had kind of forgotten about Bone Storm up mm. until this point. And I love that, yeah, given the opportunity, but like, yeah, he's still a fickle kid. He just, yeah. He... Hey, he's still a kid. And let's not forget the time Homer wanted an electronic football game for his birthday. <laughs> and his parents oh, yeah. got it. it for him. And it was the happiest day of his life. Yeah. So, I mean, do do any of you have like a Lee Carvalho's putting challenge? Like like the game that you get real excited to get and your mom just like gave you the wrong thing, but you still have to act excited? Um, have there been any gifts? Mm. I guess as an example, like I really wanted an iPod when those first came out. And so my parents bought me a Zune. Uh, which is like oh. a very terrible hey. version of the iPod. No uh, way, man! I I was a Zune stan for years. No I was way. I was running with a Zune in like 2013 until it broke. My Zune broke from overuse. <laughs> it was wow. clearly the superior machine. <laughs> I mean, another example would be I had a Game Gear instead of a Game Boy. You know, so it's just like yeah, yeah, just kind of the yeah, yeah, the little putting. Oh wow! Thing. She was trying to be with... nice. She was getting you the higher end product. Exactly, exactly. Just, and all the 17 batteries required to run it. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about Lee Carvello's putting challenge at the end. Um, sorry, I, this is not an answer to your question, but no. um, the game seems like it's for Intellivision because he did like yeah. it's clearly a console game. Like you're not mm. supposed to play it on like a PC or something. But the command to hit is seven eight seven, which if you've ever seen an Intellivision controller, it's basically a, like a keypad, a number yeah, keypad yeah. that you would slide a little. Um, plastic thing over to show what the buttons did oh, and yeah. so right. i feel like that's kind of what matches here but i don't actually i my mom was pretty good steve about actually getting what mm. i wanted yeah same like i'm remembering like the christmas where me and my brother got sonic and knuckles and that was just fucking mm. uh i was i was yeah. hysterical i, I think yeah. it was because games were so expensive that their parents were like okay is definitely this one and yeah but mind you i was also very careful like i'd cut out a photo of it i'd write down the exact title yeah <laughs> you know you don't want to make these mistakes and for no, the re- for the record my parents mostly got me very good gifts i don't mean to harp yeah. on my parents they've no. always been oh, they're, no. they're very thoughtful parents yeah. but i always think of that comparison like that bart's kind of crestfallen face and then like oh oh yay like I've gotten gifts like that before. No, yeah. it really mm. does seem like by the end of this episode, Bart has kind of lost interest in Bone Storm. Oh, yeah. Being mm. as he didn't play it when he was over at Millhouse's, yeah. and he doesn't go back to the Android dungeon to rent it. Like, yeah. he, he, they yeah. say that it's unavailable, and like, oh, it's probably they've someone's returned it by now. Yeah. See, knowing comic book guy, I like to think in this moment as well that, yeah, Marge went to the Android's dungeon to buy it, knowing <laughs> Bart is Marge's kid. Yeah. I, I assume that, yeah, CBG well, was doing a bit of trolling. Or, or even just the fact that he had so many copies of right, it. Right. He wasn't able to sell it. So he's like, this is the one everyone wants. Buy a copy of this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Woody, I will counter your Intellivision thing. I think there was one system that this could have been playing on at the time, and that is the Atari Jaguar, which had Ooh. the numbers on the little control panel. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, really? So, uh, uh, Lee Carvalho, exclusive to Atari Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would have been pretty fantastic graphically for uh, an Intellivision. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just on the graphics of these, like, I love this uh, Simpsons, how they, like, make it look so pixely as yeah. well in the animation. Even though it'd be so hard to animate. Oh, the, yeah. The graphics really haven't evolved much in the Simpsons universe. Like, I guess mm-hmm. that makes sense since no one ever ages. Their video games probably don't evolve. But, mm-hmm. like, the boxing video game we saw at the start yeah. of Low Blow Boxing has about the same level of graphical quality as uh, Lee Carvello's Putting Challenge. Well, yeah. I yep. think you've got the problem of if you made it look real, it would be indistinguishable from the characters themselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And yeah, because it's a 2D show, mm. putting 3D animation in it would be weird. So you have to like digitize it some way. Yeah. But yeah, especially of the era, this, yeah, absolutely looked the part. But uh, okay, big one, big one. How about the heart? Oh, the heart. Oof. All over it. <laughs> All over it. I mean, the whole tuck in time thing. And, yeah. you know, and I really like the bit later on where Marge doesn't yell at Bart. And he's all like, oh, yeah. man, I think I got away with Scott Free. And Lisa's like, I don't know. Like, yeah. Usually things wipe away, like this bathroom countertop. But it, Mom's heart absorbs everything that touches it, like this bathroom rug. <laughs> and just the follow-up as well of uh, Bart leaving and just the squelching of the rug as he walks over it. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's a way to have your heart and joke it too. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Well, we were talking about Mother's Day earlier um, for the very shoehorned in Mother's Day thing, and this could all this is a very Mother's Day episode, even though it's technically a Christmas episode. And mm. I'm kind of a mama's boy, and so like this this is two episodes after Mother Simpson, which I think mm. is the other oh, sort wow. of A plus hard episode um, mm. of The Simpsons, and yeah. like. They just really land in this. I don't know. This episode just hits so much that resonates with me because, like, my mom was the person who introduced me to The Simpsons because she was already a fan of Matt Groening. So oh, she yeah. was an aging hippie. And <laughs> so, you know, we watched it together and she, you know, we would enjoy different parts of it together. So I just mm-hmm. really have a lot of nostalgia for that. Yeah, um, but I yeah. love all the little bits of this that pulls focus on Marge. Like when she's, you know, Bart gets up in the morning, he's like, oh, we're going to go have a photo taken. He's up, Bart gives her a hug. He's like, I'm in a smiling mood. It's a cute little moment. And, yeah. You know, other things when she's like, oh, yeah, play the tape. We'll see that Bart didn't steal this because he's always been like a hoodlum and a vandal, but he's never really been a thief. And yeah. I like him trying to cover it up, saying, I don't want you to see this. And then it's <laughs> playing on 70 different televisions anyways. And yeah. Well, it's really nice to see that Bart's sort of love for his mother and oh, like yeah. desire to be seen well in her eyes really does sort of get to him because he's kind mm. of, you know, he's kind of incorrigible most of the time, certainly like as a result of like punishment and authority. But sort of when Marge responds in this certain way, yeah, absolutely. motherhood, it really resonates with Bart. Well, I mean, he's yeah. always trying to buck authority, but, like, the one constant for his life is that he has a mother who loves him unconditionally, and this is the first time mm. that's ever shaken in any way. Like, he's disappointed her in a way. Like, she's kind of beyond being angry. She's just mm. kind of numb towards him, which is a really scary sensation. Like, yeah. if you've ever screwed up that bad when you're a kid and you realize just, oh, man, I've, I've really done it now. Like, I don't know if I can come back from this. And what you were talking about Nancy Cartwright's performance earlier. I think that the highlight of her performance here is when um, Bart's waiting to get his uh, tuck in time express. Yeah. You know, he hears oh, it going yeah. for Lisa. And then just just the way Nancy delivers the line where it's like very like kind of eye rolly. Oh, great. Here comes tuck in time. But you also hear the vulnerability and like the the nerves mm. there like. Bart's not entirely sure that Tuck in Time Express is still coming for him. Like, he he thinks it is, and then when it doesn't, it's just so devastating. And I think that's such a perfectly executed note. Mm, yeah. And and Julie even just delivering uh, goodnight, just like a very brusque goodnight, is devastating. Yeah, after a relatively cheery Tuck in Time for Lisa. and Relatively, it was delightful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love the tuck in express but i think i don't know if i'm reading too deeply into this but yeah artistically as well when marge shuts the door and the color palette just changes immediately to yeah all these blues and stuff where bart's just having this realization yeah. and it's even gorgeous even then the physicality of that when he knows she's coming he actually kind of untucks himself a little mm. bit more in kind of anticipation of that and i think that balances really well again later when he's walking home and he hears marge laughing he's like oh mom's happy again it's yeah. like everything's fine then he realizes happy without me and it's like oh damn mm. also the snow people that they build amazing oh, yeah. snow people <laughs> amazing I, don't know, snow I, people. I have trouble just like building a round snowman and like homer's abs on that so well sculpted it's yeah. like looking into a snow mirror yeah <laughs> he's he's really showing his artistic side between the robot drawing and his uh, uh snowman yeah, sculpting like true. homer's gifted oh he is and like he's a secret virtuoso musician Absolutely. as well but yeah. i like that you know in terms of uh his role in this episode is to just be there for jokes and he's mm-hmm. not there to carry any story whatsoever so everything he does is just quick especially like him carrying bart you go, someone's got tired little legs yeah <laughs> that, where's that's, the a, flip-flop? that's another line i say from this episode quite a bit like because whenever we try and take our dogs for a walk our our older <laughs> dog our older dog always runs away he doesn't like being put in the harness so like me mm. and my wife have to kind of corner him so i'll always say get him ma <laughs> like yeah every time but also i think homer does function in the story a bit as well especially with the heart is because yeah he is taking the approach of wanting to punish him for the thing and yell at him and all that mm. but marge is the counterpoint to just be fucking leveled and totally flattened by this is, yeah homer it, is the typical yeah well let's just do this way we always do yeah mm-hmm. and uh it shows that indifference to marge so much more yeah which clearly where bart's just like you know copying it because this is what he's used to but yeah having mom to an apathetic fuck Mm -hmm. yeah and i mean for her too this is her first time seeing him as like an actual criminal yeah i think up until now it's always been kind of boys will be boys kind of mischief and now she's 
really thinking hard about his path. And it's just like, wow, he's actually he's stealing things. He's getting arrested by, I mean, a, a mall security guard, but still a scary mall security guard. And this is a glimpse into her future. And I think she's going through a lot of emotions right now, not just that her son is like turning away, but like her failings as a parent, you know? There's a lot going on. Yeah, and like not to speed through this, but yeah, the fucking ending. Oh Ugh. my god! Like, because it was a sort of weird mess direct. I don't know what we were meant to be expecting. Was he gonna go for like a big score now? But yeah, the fucking reveal with the photo and mm. like Marge just fucking melting. Oh mm. my god! Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I we, was welling up. We so know much. from the security guard. You know, today he's stealing video games. Tomorrow he'll be stealing stadiums and quarries. <laughs> so maybe he had a quarry under there. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, th- I think it's beautiful. I-, I love the smaller picture rebalancing the family picture. Like mm-hmm. everything's, oh, everything's kind of back the way it was. And weirdly, it made me think of the last episode we watched with the, you know, we're stealing about to people to restore the balance. It's like the seasons, you know? Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of elements that are just kind of when you think about them too much, they seem kind of ham-fisted in. Like mm-hmm. Bart sort of monologuing to no one of I'll show them what a black sheep can do. Yeah. And then, like, the picture having a big paid and full receipt on it. Yeah. And then just the way that sure. picture balances, it all just kind of feels very set up to, like, get that emotional payoff. Mm. But that emotional payoff still works really, really well. And oh, yeah. I don't. I think that the fact that this episode is a Christmas episode really benefits it. Because it's mm. like, this is about, like, togetherness. And, like, I just feel like the combination of Bart and Marge is mm. the least explored combination of the main family. Yeah. And this episode just really nails it. Yeah, and even if you didn't feel that hard hitting somehow, <laughs> uh, there's still a. It's followed up by great jokes. Well, because I got a present early, why don't you get a present early? And then Lisa's all like, if he gets a present early, how about I get a present early? No, you have to wait. It's the worst Christmas ever. Yeah, I love these moments where Lisa s- is still a kid. Yeah. Like, oh, if he just... gets a Huawei Pop, I want a Huawei Pop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but. Because, yeah, it still feels totally in keeping with her character. Mm. Segway. Integrity. Did it feel like The Simpsons? Yes, it did. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. It, it also, it does feel unique. It feels like, I don't want to say it's like a very special episode because it doesn't have like that treacliness to it. Like, I think the yeah. emotional beats here. I mean, it definitely has more treacliness to it than like the great money caper. It does, yeah. but, but it's also but it's not real. like. It's not like full house, like queuing up music to tug your heartstrings without having earned it. Like, I think all of the emotional beats in here feel very lived in and very real, and they earn Mm. all of the emotion that they get. Yeah, Yeah. there's a good little, uh, first of all, setup and then reprise that I think works really well, which is, you know, Bart's over at Millhouse's place, and then Millhouse gets him out going, Mom, Bart's (laughs) swearing! And they're just (laughs) shoved out, and then later... Damn it, I wasn't swearing. (laughs) That always makes me laugh. Then later on with uh, Bart smoking, he's like, can I just hang out with you while you do mom stuff? And just the end of that, (laughs) tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm good is so sad. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Yeah. The Millhouse's house, there's a very weird geometry of a scene mm-hmm. where Millhouse's room is upstairs and you see him playing the game. There's a door to one side, and then Bart comes in from the other side, mm-hmm. like without oh. Millhouse noticing. And you're like, what mm-hmm. is the geometry of Millhouse's house? Like, it must have a huge house where he has like two exits from his bedroom. Yeah. Non Euclidean. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. about to say. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, to be uh, able to afford a video game that can uh, be as expensive and including $70. I fucked that up entirely. Never mm. mind. <laughs> up to and including $70. Yep. Which was but, right. I remember buying uh, yeah. Clay Fighter yeah. on the Sega Genesis, and it was about that much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it was probably much worse than Bonestorm. Though, <laughs> frankly, Bonestorm doesn't look like a great game. <laughs> it, no. it looks like, I think Milhouse's reaction to Bonestorm was my reaction to Clay Fighter. Like, yeah, you're so into it for the first five minutes. And then you're like, oh, this is all this game is. Okay, I'm done. Oh, it got okay. boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really into working with actual clay now. You never know which way these crazy clay wheels are going to sculpt. <laughs> oh, my love. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, especially, yeah, being a big Mortal Kombat fan as a kid, I just, yeah, absolutely adored the parody in this oh, yeah. episode. Yeah. But yes, no, would you watch it again? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd watch it again right now. Yeah. I'm going to call up my mom and we'll watch it together. Yeah. 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 Watch it with your mom. I do think that this episode, I know it so well and I mm. sort of know all the beats and all the jokes 
that I probably have a little less fun watching it than like I yeah. did, for example, The Great Money Cape, where I had forgotten a lot of the jokes that were in it. Solid point, But that yeah. still doesn't really affect sort of the brilliance that I think that it has. I mean, it's, it's a rare episode of a TV show that is going to be funny on your 30th watching of it. Mm-hmm. But this one still gets to me from an emotional standpoint. Absolutely. Oh, definitely. And it will be a great Christmas tradition as well. And, mm. you know, um, much like Christmas episode playlists, we like to think about other playlists. I am losing Smooth. my words at this stage of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other epi- Simpsons episodes remind you of this one? Video games. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, where, uh, where uh, Lisa gets obsessed with Dash Dingo. Yeah, that'd be yeah. a good yeah. one. Yep. Or the one where Bart and Homer have that uh, punch-out yep. game. Oh, yeah. 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 From Moaning Lisa, very mm. another fucking emotional gut wrench ride. Yeah, and I vaguely recall an episode like from one of the later seasons where they're playing Halo because uh, Homer's like teabagging Marge. Oh. I don't know. I remember what? that. Yeah, that's like ep- season. It's yeah, not like that, but yeah, but also yeah. he's doing that well, in Halo. It's like, look, I killed you, and now I'm desecrating your corpse. Well, like, we watched that um, for this podcast. We watched the esports episode. Yeah, oh, right. the League of Legends one. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, yeah, amazing one-time guest star, Simpsons characters. Yeah, Kirk Douglas uh, on in the Itchy and Scratchy episode. Yeah, he's a great Ern- one-off. Ern- uh, Ernest Borgnine gets eaten by a bear. Ernest Borgnine yeah. was awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that was the uh, Bill and Josh, the showrunners for uh, these couple seasons. Basically, if you had like an old rock and roll star, it was Mike Scully, and if yeah. you had like an old surly man, <laughs> it was Bill and Josh, like an old yeah. surly character actor. Old surly man playlist. I mm. love it. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, Troy McClure playlist. I agree. It wasn't one of his best, but fucking just love to hear that silky smooth voice of Phil Yeah, anything, Hi, I'm Troy McClure. I was like, I already like it. Yeah. Oh, Shag Shazeramesh. Yeah. <laughs> Thus completing my plea bargain with the good people at Foot Locker. <laughs> <laughs> Foot Locker of all places. All right, Steve, what would you like to change about this episode? Oh, man. I don't know that I would change much. Like, like I agree that the Troy McClure bit isn't one of their stronger ones, but I think the lead up to that Troy McClure, that dead silence of uh, Brodka mm. staring him down and then just slamming the tape in makes whatever's on there mm. worth it. That's oh, yeah. a fantastic build up. Yeah. No, I, I, I think this is as close to perfect as The Simpsons gets. How about you, Woody? I would change. I, why is there a woman smoking in her bra? in the warehouse when they walk in from the mall like when thank you i do not Don know Rodka, like pulls bart back from the try and save there's just a woman sitting there in her bra smoking and it's very <laughs> odd yeah well you don't smoke in your like a uh, uniform when you're working because it'll get cigarette oh. smoke in it. so okay. if you want to smoke you go out back and you strip down that's not sure. bad. I made okay. that up, but it seems but that that tracks. Well, that could, I was yeah. about to ask you: Do your female employees have they been doing that? I mean, check, not, check I know the cameras. Hmm? <laughs> oh, you can check the cameras at www. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no. Um, the other thing is, I noticed um, in some of the games that are on the shelf, one of them is called Save Hitler's Brain, yeah. and another one is uh, Simreich. Yeah, um, oh, and I will say you don't need two Nazi yeah. references in your game parodies. Like ju- you can you can come up with something better than Simreich. Well, and in the family photos as well, with Bart doing uh, the comb, he was doing like a little bit of a Hitler thing there, right? As well, because he like had his hand up. I can't oh, I never things. even thought of that. I saw oh, the wow. mustache. I don't remember the hand. Yeah. Um, they also had a streetcar named Death, which looks like it was maybe <laughs> like a trolley problem simulator. All right, <laughs> nice. <laughs> How about you, BT? What would you like to change? Oh, man. I mean, that when he first drags Bart into the security office, it is kind of a mess, but I think that kind of works. Like, it feels awkward, and it should. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if that's the problem, because they couldn't get the all the dialogue they wanted, and they had to cut around what they had. Do you guys, um, do you guys like the scene where Don Brodka pulls out the little Lunchable from his yes. drawer <laughs> and is trying so to spread much. the little cheese on it? It's so weird. And he's like, that, God damn, so piece of crap. They picked the <laughs> but perfect I still like snack it. food for that scene. Like, I can't imagine a sillier snack food for the scariest man in the world to be eating. <laughs> That's perfect. Like, if he pulled out some yeah. yogurt. And it's one of those things that now will play in the brain as you try and spread cheese on a cracker that yeah. snaps. <laughs> Yeah, and it's God one of those things where you you want your grizzled detective to do something every day and it's just not, yeah. not worth it. Ah, stupid piece of crap. That's it. 
you know, piece of crap. just because he's a th- big, scary uh, sh- mole detective doesn't mean he doesn't have Lunchables. Yeah. Yeah. He got yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I wouldn't change a fucking goddamn thing. Um, this is a very, very good episode, and I'm dumb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're here. Uh, Steve, do you have any other notes? The only other note I noticed here, I think this might be my first time watching this episode in HD. I watched it on Disney+, Plus, and I've mostly been reliant on my old DVDs. So I never noticed some of the background signs. And the only one really worth noting uh, was the fake logs when they walk into the try and save are called Eternal Logs. And I think that's a better name than Duraflame. I don't know. That's yeah. the only. That's the only thing I had. That's the only new thing I noticed. It's not really in this a one. joke. It's just like a good name. Just for like that a kind good. Yeah, yeah, just a good, well-named thing. Like that's not like the the Fontendo Z. That's not yeah. you know Maple. That's an actual product name that they put thought into. Yeah. No, absolutely. Fuck, I didn't even look out for many of those background jokes. Yeah. I only saw the ones that were direct, right, and center, like the riot chair on sale. There was yeah. one I didn't quite. <laughs> that was great. There was one I didn't quite grab the entire thing. It was something like, "To respect our Lord and Savior, we will be open all day." christmas day or something yeah like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good one yeah other than that that's the only really i kind of stopped taking notes because i just got caught up into it like i always do yeah, and uh, i love it mm. how about you woody any other notes the photographer at the try and save only has pictures of flanders there's three pictures of the flanders family <laughs> up behind the main area and then there's that man of the year parody I mean, he's which very is just odd. You yeah. think that he would use some like different families there as well to show yeah. his range of experience <laughs> you would think how about you, BT? Any other notes? For sure. If Tuck and Time is lame, then I guess I'm just a big lame. <laughs> mm. I really don't want to eat a candy cane made out of gingerbread. That sounds disgusting. <laughs> it's just the shape of, man. It's oh, not... okay. It's not like mint and ginger You're at the same time. You're overthinking this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I do like when Marge's like, ooh, I've always wanted to watch like that. Well, maybe someone will get you one for Christmas. <laughs> now she'll be really surprised when you open that ironing board cover. Oh, it, which. It is like, okay, it's a great joke and you could have put any object, but ironing board I cover. Know, it's mm. so terrible. It always gets me because I think it's just going to be ironing board. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, it's even <laughs> worse than that. It's, it's like an ironing uh, board already has a cover on it. Like it's already, you yeah, know, the whole point. It's, it's like the least uh, useful thing. But not like this, it doesn't. But I also <laughs> like it because it could very easily be jerk ass Homer, but I feel this is more golden retriever Homer of just, yeah. it'll be fun. You he know? saw yeah. something that he thought Marge would like and just like, oh, I'm going to surprise her big and not get her a watch. Yeah. And I was like that time where the, they sent the nuclear submarine to go fight the piranhas. One of the piranhas oh, swam yeah. down the periscope and bit the guy in the eye. And he's like, ah, ah. <laughs> and my final one is honestly a joke that I didn't even know existed. And I, I had to have Elliot pause it so I could write it down properly. <laughs> (laughs) Which is the very beginning, it goes, uh, The Krusty Kind of Christmas, brought to you by ILG, selling pure buddies chemicals after you die, and Little Sweetheart Cupcakes, a subsidiary of ILG. It's like, holy shit! (laughs) Also, you gotta love that they open this episode with a KKK joke. I know, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, okay. Without calling any attention to it whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it just moves through at such a brisk pace and, you know, just waits for those hang on a fucking yeah, minute yeah. moments. It was literally like, wait the fuck up. I have to write that down. <laughs> oh, uh, that is all my notes. Elliot, back to you. All right. And final notes. And oh, that's all of them except for I just love the animation when Bart's fake nose falls off and the dog just starts eating it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Fills his whole mouth. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It reminds me of when you feed a dog like something really chewy, like peanut butter or something, where <laughs> they're just enjoying the experience, but their mouth, like, can't rub, rub, rub. <laughs> keep up with it. I don't know. All right, guys. It is time to rank this thing. Let's do it. BT, you are first. I'm going to go with a cubic zirconia. Even though there's a part of me that feels like intellectually this maybe should only be a gold, it is just, I mean, the heart is absolutely perfect. The jokes are still great. The fact that whole ILG bit I completely forgot about and blew me away the second I heard it. Yeah, it's hell funny. It's really heartfelt. It's everything you could want in an episode. Yeah, I mean, it was brought up earlier where, you know, familiarity can probably sometimes get in the way, so I really try and be objective throughout my reviews. As much as we can, yeah. Holy fuck, this is just an all-timer for me, and, like, it makes me so happy that it's held up this well when I have seen it that many times. So, yeah, cubic zirconia for me, full marks, Woody. Um, Ten stars, five thumbs up, A+. (laughs) That's that's the system, right? Um, No, uh, cubic... Yeah, whatever the perfect score is, a cubic zirconium. This is one of my one of my all time favorite. I don't know. I feel like it's one of those aspects of like entertainment that feels like it was just designed so specifically for me. 
Uh, right. And it's executed so well because it touches on so many themes that matter to me. Yeah, it's I I love it. And Steve, finish it off. Uh, I think we got a perfect uh, batting ra- average here. I'm, I'm going Zirconia yeah, as well. I love this episode. This is a top 10 episode for me, definitely. Uh, and I think Woody hit, hit the nail on the head. I've never felt so seen as an 11-year-old boy <laughs> than I did the first time I saw this episode. Like I, I, I felt like whoever wrote it really understood what it was to be a kid. They really understood the the fear of it and the the intenseness and the mistakes and everything i think they really nailed it uh just across the board not really anything of substance that i would change one all-time great guest voice and just so many memorable moments that you're just gonna be quoting for the rest of your life yeah uh, a perfect Mm. perfect episode awesome well that will be a unanimous cubic zirconia. Mm-hmm. So we are giving this episode the Simpsons Index Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Field of Excellence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this will be the 10th episode from Season 7 that we've reviewed. We've like reviewed about 17 episodes mm. from Season 7 so far. This will be the 10th getting a, a unanimous perfect rating. It'll be joining Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 2, Radioactive Man, Bart Sells His Soul, Lisa the Vegetarian, Bart the Fink, Home of the Smithers, The Day the Violence Died, 22 Short Films, and and the Curse of the Flying Hellfish. Nice. Yeah. Wouldn't... Those all got perfect scores? Yep. Yeah. Wow. I think that secretly season seven might be the best season of The Simpsons. Mm. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's sneaking up there. It's a close race between five, six, and seven. Mm. But yeah. yeah. I would throw eight in there, too. I mean, you get back to back, like, uh, you only move twice and uh, uh, mm-hmm. Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie show. And like, eight has a lot of really high points, but there's also a, some filler in there. Okay, fair, yeah. fair, yeah. Yeah, you start seeing the bad trends creeping in around then. But yeah, for my money as well, season seven is just oh, fucking incredible. All right, guys. Well, we have one last very important question mm-hmm. that I forgot to ask you. You know, it's a tradition to ask our first time guest this question. But of course, BT wasn't there last time. So yeah. it felt wrong asking it without him. So You can do things without me. Sometimes I'm not here. Well, it feels better <laughs> to throw the most important question we ask on this podcast to you. BT, ask away. All right, so our question is, if you could have a sandwich named after you, what would be on that sandwich? And if that question is too difficult, because it is the hardest question in life, other than Kirk or Picard, the follow-up question is, what's the best sandwich? Oh, boy. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I, I got it. You got it. Go. Yep. I got it. Uh, the Woody has garlic bread, mm-hmm. banana peppers, salami, Dijon mustard, and oil and vinegar. All right, got some wow. heat in there. I like it. Wow. Very elegant and you, simple. You knew that straight off the bat as well. Is this I do. A, a, I, I a regular always, for you? Yep. <laughs> when, I went to, when I went to Disneyland, um, the thing that I was most excited about is there's a restaurant at Disneyland called Earl of Sandwich. Yes. Um, ah, that place is good. And I like every meal. I'm like, okay, whatever girlfriend I'm dating at the time who wants to go to Disneyland. <laughs> um, I will go with you if we can eat at Earl of Sandwich every mm. meal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and- Beach, remember when we went to Disneyland and they had that uh, Thanksgiving dinner sandwich? Yes. Oh, oh my God, so that was good. good. I forgot about that sandwich. That was a good sandwich. We ended up eating at that place like four times. It was really good, and we liked That's sandwiches. That's the right choice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about you, Steve? I think the Steve is a very simple sandwich. It's basically just a grilled cheese, but you've got slices of nice roasted Black Forest ham in there. Mm-hmm. You've got a little bits of hot sauce on there, and you've got mm. uh, uh, a little bit, just a little bit of spinach. Yeah, just a light oh, little layer of spinach underneath the cheese. This is a sandwich I make all the time. It's the Steve. Nice. Oh, wonderful. Like yeah. Man, you guys knew what you were doing. Yeah. Like a lot of people like start cracking under pressure they and sweating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey man, we got ner- we got nerves of steel when it comes to sandwich talk. <laughs> That's gonna be our you... new spin off podcast called Sandwich Talk with yeah, Woody you, and Steve. You can ask us the tough sandwich questions. We do not pull punches. <laughs> All right. Nice. Good to know. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh Steve Woody, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you for having us. Always always a pleasure to watch and talk about the Simpsons. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I'd love to have you on again. But, you know, for our fans who uh, may not be familiar with your work in the podcast field, what else are you doing? Sure. I'll, I'll talk about one. What do you talk about the other? All so right. uh, we've got two podcasts, but the first is uh, Ultra 64. That's a podcast mm-hmm. where we are playing every single game on the Nintendo 64 catalog, at least the ones released in North America. So very sorry, mm-hmm. Australia. I think you guys got a couple that we didn't. Um, yeah, you miss out on Beetle Adventure Racing and Holden Adventure Racing. Yeah, We got Beetle yes. Adventure Racing. We got Beetle. Racing. 
Beetle. Yeah, we got Beetle, but we didn't get the other oh, one. Oh, yeah. but you didn't yeah. get the Holden Not one. Not the Holden oh, no. one. Ah. No. Um, Too Aussie, mate. But yeah, you can find us at ultra64podcast.com. We also have a Patreon. That's patreon.com slash ultra64pod. And on there, we talk about lots of other games that aren't on the Nintendo 64. So we've got a lot of fun ones coming out. And um, yeah, we've got quite a few back episodes of Ultra 64. So never too late to jump in yeah. and uh, dig through the catalog. Yeah, yep. it's almost we've covered more than 200 games on it. Wow. So if yeah. you really want to know a lot about Nintendo 64, that is your place to go. The other podcast we do, which is actually coming to an end, but don't worry, that doesn't mean that we're pulling all the old episodes or anything, is we are reading through the book Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. I've already read it. I finished it. I finished it last week. Finished it this I week. I still have not. <laughs> and Yeah, so you guys are here at a very important time where I know the exciting conclusion and Steve doesn't. But, I have two um, days Check to get in together. on that. It, yeah, it's basically we're reading through 50 pages at a time. So if you decide now is the time where you want to read a very depressing and anxiety-producing book, yeah. which would be a strange choice, but uh, we're there for you. We got yeah. you covered. That's called uh, <laughs> Jest Friends is the name of that podcast. J-E-S-T Friends. Yeah, I hate to ruin the ending, but the jest ends. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't infinite the whole time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Disappointing, I know. He, he died before he could write the next several sequels, you know? It's like the Avatar <laughs> 2 of our time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. And BT, our other show. Our other show is Thrones of Game, the Game of Thrones podcast that watches the series backwards. I've already seen the entire show, but Elliot had never watched a single episode until we started watching in reverse order. So it gives us a really unique perspective on this show, and we just love chatting about it and coming up with theories of how did this all come together. Mm. That's Thrones of Game, the only Game of Thrones podcast still with content. Awesome. And with the plugs uh, done, I think that about wraps it up for the Simpsons Index this week. Yeah, Woody and Steve, thanks again so much. This is an absolute great time. Oh, we had a blast. Thank you so yeah. much for having us. And BT, thank you as always. Uh-huh. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been your host, Elliot J. O'Neill. That's all the mustard in the house. Thank you for listening to the Simpsons Index podcast, which is also an online spreadsheet available at thesimpsonsindex.com. You can chat to us online at facebook.com slash The Simpsons Index or at Simpsons Index on Twitter or Instagram. Now there's no bonus scenes for this episode, so we'll catch you next week.